All right, I call to order the meeting of the Antioch Unified School District Board of Education at 6.30. Uh, we'll start off with the uh, establishment of quorum. Trustee Hack. I'm here. Trustee Lathan. Here. Trustee Lewis. Here. Vice President Rocha. Here. President Hernandez. Here. All right, next we have closed session. Our one item is conference with labor negotiator, agency negotiator, Dr. Robert Martinez, employer organization, Antioch Education Association, and senior management. So we'll return back at 7 p.m.
I call the meeting back to order at 7.01 uh, p.m. We will start with the reestablishment of quorum. Okay. Trustee Hack? I'm here. Trustee Lathan? Here. Trustee Lewis? Present. Vice President Rocha? Here. President Hernandez? Here. Um, item 3B, reports from closed session. There are none. Item 3C, flag salute. Uh, Trustee Lewis, will you lead us in the flag salute? I absolutely will. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. That's a pretty cover. Next, we'll move on to item 3D, approval of minutes for the special Board of Education meeting of March 7th, 2024. Um, so if there's any discussion on that, otherwise I will entertain a motion to approve the minutes as presented. Move approval. Second. All right, so it's been moved and seconded to approve the minutes for the special Board of Education meeting of March 7th, 2024. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say no. And the motion passes. Moving on to four superintendents reports, I'll turn it over to the superintendent. Yes, good evening. So I'm pleased to announce that Measure B has been certified by county elections and it has passed. So we'll, I know, much needed upgrades to our schools are coming. Um, next steps in April, we'll be establishing the Citizen Bond Oversight Committee. In May, we'll be bringing a preliminary official statement to the board for review. In June, the board will um, have before them the preliminary official statement for approval. In July, uh, Ms. Robbins and myself will meet with Standards and Poor and Moody's where we'll do our bond rating and hopefully um, have good news for the board on that. And then in August is actually when the sale of the bonds will occur. So a lot of, a lot of the work um, will most likely take place, not a lot of it, but we'll begin in the fall. We're meeting with architects next week to go over some of their initial renderings and talk about timelines. So we'll be sharing that with the board also. Um, I'm also pleased to share that we have settled our contract negotiations with AEA. And I just wanna thank, yay. <laughs> thank you. I just wanna sincerely thank both bargaining teams um, for their dedication and commitment to our district. So thank you to all. And that concludes my report this evening. Yes. Can you give an update on the committees, the special education committee and the equity committee, like where we are? Yes. Um, or the board member, if if President Hernandez wants to do that during his comments. Um, or you want me to just? Yeah, you can, yeah I think now you can just share. Okay, yeah. yes. So for the special education committee, uh, Ms. Rocha and I were speaking about it yesterday and where we're gonna go as far as next step, the equity ad hoc committee is meeting, uh, principals are gonna start in working with them in May, but in April, the board, thank you, Dr. Lathan, for all of your work on this and having a broad-based um, community support and stakeholders um, to join in that work to review the equity audits. And I think that's, I hope I captured everything. And then with the PLA ad hoc committee, we did um, have an initial meeting, then we had our first meet and greet with um, representative from the trades union. And so our attorneys are going to talk about some parameters and then that will be brought back to the ad hoc committee to discuss and maybe revise anything they might wanna do in which time when it's finalized, their recommendation will come to the board. Thank you. Sure. All right, moving on to item 5A, high school student representatives report. Do we have a representative from one of the high schools this week? I do not see one, so I think we will move forward. Great, so we'll move on to item 5B, Antioch Charter Academy and Antioch Charter Academy 2 annual performance review. Good evening, board members, Superintendent Anello. We do have a presentation, so. Um, thank you for allowing us to present an annual update to you. Tonight, you will hear from members of the co-administration team from ACA and ACA2. I actually like to introduce you to them. So we have Todd Heller, Vicki Willard, Marianne Dubitsky, Kevin Fuller, Sarah McLean, 
And Elisa McCutcheon. So those are our co-administrators from ACA and ACA2. And I know, Dr. Jag, uh, you haven't had a chance to meet them yet because you're new on the board. So I just wanted to make sure you knew who they were. So we'd like to begin by painting you a picture of our programs and what makes us unique. Next slide, please. Oh, I guess I'll do it. You're right. Thank you. I'm not used to having control. It's so nice. Okay, the original name of the charter was the Learner Centered School. And although the name has changed, the research-based philosophies, which are the basis of our programs, have not. In the last two years, we've uh, come up in front of the board to update you on two of our cornerstone philosophies, brain-compatible, highly effective teaching, and the Montessori philosophy. Today, we will take a peek at another core philosophy, positive discipline, by Jane Nelson et al. Antioch Charter Academy's positive discipline component incorporates all members of the ACA community. Let's take a closer look. Positive discipline is a program designed to teach young people to become responsible, respectful, and resourceful members of the community. Based on the best-selling books, Positive Discipline by Jane Nelson, Lynn Lott, Sherilyn Irwin and others, it teaches important social and life skills in a manner that is deeply respectful and encouraging for both children and adults. Recent research tells us that children are, quote, hardwired from birth to connect with others, and that children who feel a sense of connection to their community, family, and school are less likely to misbehave. A little history of positive discipline. Dr. Alfred Adler was uh, first introduced his idea of parenting education in the US in the 1920s. Adler showed that a misbehaving child is a discouraged child. Rudolf Dreikers brought classroom techniques into the US in the late 1930s. Dreikers recognized four main goals and misbehaviors. And Lynn Lott and Jane Nelson wrote the Positive Discipline book in 1981. Nelson's books give teachers, parents, the tools to help children learn self-discipline, responsibility, cooperation, and problem-solving skills. And in fact, when I was a brand new teacher here in Antioch, I saw Jane Nelson speak in this district put on by uh, this board. It was a very exciting time. So to be successful, contributing members of their community, children must learn necessary social and life skills. Positive discipline is based on the understanding that discipline must be taught and that discipline teaches. Children who feel a sense of connection to their community, family, and school are less likely to misbehave. And at both charter schools, we emphasize the importance of fostering a sense of belonging and significance. Positive discipline identifies four criteria for effective discipline. Number one, connection. Discipline is helping children feel a sense of belonging and connection. Number two, mutual respect. Discipline is mutually respectful and encouraging. Staff members are kind and firm at the same time. Number three, long-term effectiveness. Discipline considers what the child is thinking, feeling, and learning and deciding about the world long term and what to do to survive and to thrive. And number four, social and life skills. Discipline teaches important life skills and social skills. Respect, concern for others, problem solving, cooperation, as well as the skills to contribute to home, to school, and the community are all taught. Let's go a little deeper into this core philosophy. Adults model firmness by respecting themselves and the needs of the situation, and kindness by respecting the needs of the child. This is mutual respect. Adults try to identify the belief behind behaviors. By identifying the belief behind the behavior, effective discipline recognizes the reasons kids do what they do, and, what, and works to change those beliefs rather than merely attempting to change behavior. 
This internal look takes time and is extremely important for the child's life long term. Effective communication. And problem solving skills are key components of positive discipline. The whole school population holds discussions, meetings, assemblies, and presentations. Each level holds classroom meetings with an agenda created by students and staff. And encouragement. Encouragement notices effort and improvement. It's not just success, and it builds on long-term self-esteem and empowerment. So staff members and students focus on solutions instead of punishment. Punishment works short-term. It stops behavior quickly, but we focus on actually long-term um, solutions. So we strive to be aware of what children are feeling and thinking and deciding that affects them long term in a situation. We seek to help them develop a sense that they are capable, they are capable of change for the better, and we help them use their personal power in useful ways so that they can contribute to our society. Positive discipline is a student-centered approach. Students are part of the decision-making process. Together, we decide on rules for our mutual benefit. We decide on solutions that are helpful to all concerned when problems arise. And it teaches, if teachers must use their own judgment without student input, they use firmness with kindness, dignity, and respect. All involved learn self-discipline and responsibility. A warm school climate is created where students are seen as individuals and wherein teachers show a sincere interest in a student's personal goals, problems, and achievements. Together, we learn social interest, which is having a concern for others and a sincere desire to contribute to society. Together, we develop clear procedures, rules, consequences. We create a sense of ownership and belonging um, in fact, social political action projects are one manifestation of social interests that arise on our classroom agendas where students will put on ideas of things they would like to do for their community. Here are some examples of positive discipline in action at the charter schools. So you'll see pictured here positive discipline um, in the classrooms, so like a classroom meeting is happening here where students circle up, they're all equal with the teacher and they have this conversation. Um, there's social political action where students are working on a farm and planning here at, um, as a big break. Um, so positive discipline focuses on fostering this sense of community within a classroom. It encourages teachers to create an inclusive and supportive environment where students feel valued and connected to one another. That's pretty much what I wanted to share with you about positive discipline. Um, we are, it's a, like I said, a core philosophy. Kevin's gonna come up here and talk to you about program operations and we'll finish up our presentation. Thanks. Hi. There are several new and continuing program updates. Both sites continue to have expanded learning opportunity programs running, serving students TK through eighth grade. Both ACA and ACA2 completed a full self-study this school year. We both look forward to another six-year accreditation from WASC. Middle school boys and girls began taking part in two athletic programs, cheer and soccer competing against Park and Orchard Park in the last two weeks. Lastly, ACA and ACA2 offer unique opportunities for our employees, allowing them to get educational assistance from the charter to cover tuition costs for furthering their education. Multiple staff members have participated, earning their SPED credential and their Montessori credentials. This is our sixth year as our own LEA for special education with the El Dorado Charter SELPA. Currently, our special education percentages are shown 15% at ACA and 22% at ACA2. Our resource services incorporate Linda Mood Bell and Montessori strategies. 
We also have students receiving speech, language, occupational therapy, counseling, and one-to-one -one aid services. Since our special education students are fully integrated into general education, with a service schedule that fits into their day without disrupting instruction, they receive the full benefit of our student-centered curriculum. Both ACA and ACA II have been fully WASC accredited by the Western Association of Schools and Colleges for the last 14 years for ACA II and the last 16 years for ACA. Typically, only high schools and colleges are required to go through the WASC accreditation process. Both schools choose to be WASC accredited in order to validate our successes and create and help create meaningful goals for our future. So next, I'd like to bring up uh, Mrs. McCutcheon, and she's going to talk about some of our academic standings. Is the ACA and ACA2 program effective? Our data continues to say yes. In 2023, CASP test scores for both ACA and ACA2 match or exceed the state average proficiency for English language arts. Both schools are close to the state average proficiency in math for school-wide proficiency. However, we're proud of that both schools continue to have the strongest scores in the sixth to eighth grade range, surpassing the state average in both English language arts and math. The data shows that the majority of students' CAF scores increase over time with higher percentages of students reaching proficiency by the end of eighth grade. This chart shows ACA English language arts proficiency by grade level. And the center diagonal in green shows the progress of a cohort from the time they were third graders through their eighth grade year last year with an increased proficiency of 13% over that time. Similarly at ACA two, Student proficiency improves when comparing scores from year to year for all students. On average, at ACA2, student achievement in English language arts increased over 15% looking at that cohort from third grade to eighth grade. In math, this data represents proficiency by grade level on CASP for ACA. Although ACA has seen some growth, it's been minimal and not typical for the program. So both internal measures and star renaissance math scores show student growth in mathematics. And looking at all this data has led ACA stakeholders to create an action plan to look at creating CASP scores for ACA or improving CASP scores for ACA students. And that will be part of the next three to six year LCAP and WASC goal cycle. And at ACA2, the student trend of increasing scores over time is also true for math. On average at ACA2, student achievement in math increased 9% by the time each cohort completed eighth grade. So while our school has three core philosophies, we chose to focus on positive discipline by Jane Nelson for today's presentation to highlight one of the components that makes our schools unique and effective. We aim to foster a sense of connection and mutual respect in children while teaching them important social and life skills for long-term effectiveness, ultimately encouraging them to discover their capabilities and contribute positively to their communities. Positive discipline helps us achieve that by putting best practices based on neuroscience into action. At ACA and ACA2, we are creating lifelong learners and preparing our students for time beyond our schools, including feeding into AUSD high schools and beyond. So on behalf of ACA and ACA2, the co-administrator team, our staff and ACA community, we'd like to thank you for your time this evening. We love our school and could talk about it for a very, very long time, but in the interest of time, what you will find is additional data a brief list of facility updates and future needs included at the end of the slide deck we provided. So again, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Uh, do any of my colleagues have any questions or comments? We can start with Trustee Lewis. Uh, so first of all, thank you for coming. I know many of you. Um, thank you for coming. And, and so the, 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 the idea behind positive discipline 
you know, why was that so, I guess my question is, uh, why is that so uh, foundational uh, for ACA and ACA2? I'll start there. <laughs> because I think it sets our community. So that's how we sort of, that's how we see it. You know, you need a strong community if you're going to go further in any area in your life. And so it is, uh, it builds our community. So our community is based on, on these beliefs and we all had to sort of learn to change our beliefs about how things work because we weren't raised under these kinds of beliefs, but now we have a very strong community because of it. Okay. It's and the foundation. Are there any shortcomings or any challenges to having this approach to discipline? I mean, because as you mentioned, yeah. it is an adjustment. I think the, you know, honestly, it works really well. Our parents are very, um, very responsive to it. I think in the beginning years, there was more education needed. I think now there's less um, because it's, it takes time and it, re and it requires the community effort because uh, sometimes it's hard when you want that child that did that thing, you know, to your th child just kicked out, <laughs> throw them out to the streets. And we say, no, that's not what we do here. We actually are gonna try to help this child change their behaviors, work towards the long term. And so every once in a while that comes up. So that's probably the biggest challenge. And then spending that time with parents, helping them understand why we're, we're doing that. Thank you, a wonderful presentation. You're welcome. Thank you. Vice yeah. President Rocha, any comments or questions? It was interesting to see that you had a dyslexia certificate. Do you have many children in that facility? That I'm sorry, I Dyslexia. Oh, dyslexia I certification? That you had a certificate. Yeah, we have a teacher right now who just did educational assistance, applied for some money assistance for her program for dyslexia certification. Yes, we absolutely do see students um, that are showing it's dyslexia as a need, but right now it's minimal, but we do have some. But we have Good. a teacher who's super interested in it, so we wanted to support her. Right. Positive. That seems to be the, we're, the yeah. direction that we're finding. Yeah, we sure are. Yeah, um, and the language I was noting, seeing two, I see 10 here and eight and two, uh, language acquisition. So I guess you have, uh, you're, I was wondering about the ESL. Yes, we have a, we like have a, have a you, if you look at our demographics. I saw that. Yeah, we have, that's what oh, I was asking about Yeah, we have that. quite a large percentage of Hispanic students mm -hmm. and um, English language learners at both schools. Um, that number has been increasing. It um, seems to be more on two than in one. Yes. That could be because of um, some preferences that are given to two to make sure that the students come from that area, whereas ACA hasn't done that preferences and it wouldn't necessarily matter, but where ACA2 is located near the fairgrounds, they want to give preferences to students who can just walk to the school, and that might be why the numbers oh, are a little okay. different. Thank you. You're welcome. Trustee Hack, any comments or questions? I do. Um, I came to Antioch when I was 22, 23 years old with a beard, mm -hmm. not much hair, but with a beard. <laughs> and I Sorry. started teaching at Sutter Elementary. Brand new school, wasn't even finished. D complex wasn't built yet. And I met this teacher called Jeannie Dubisky. Mm -hmm. She taught second grade, and I taught fifth or sixth or whatever. We became partners, yeah. and so we, we shared. And there was many a lunchtime. <laughs> I would leave my class in D complex, go up to A complex, and help Jeannie change her room around mm -hmm to a Montessori model for the afternoons. It's the first time I'd ever thought about Montessori. Yeah, it's amazing. It's phenomenal. She was great. And then you guys went to the charter school. Mm -hmm. And so I saw Jeannie, you know, I've seen her for a long time, all the time. And she said, and I said, why are you doing this? And she said, do you know where Hazel's Burgers is? You guys don't know where Hazel's Burgers is, but nevertheless, by the fairgrounds, you go out towards Pittsburgh on the back road, and Hazel's is right there. Yep. Well, back then it was really busy with, uh, you know, ladies out there shivering hot. That wasn't the hamburger place. It was Hazel's. Right. This charter school is a Hazel <laughs> burger. It's not just a regular burger. And that's, you guys have done it for years. Thank you. Good yeah, I feel like we're, we're definitely trying to do and something that works. Yeah, and Jeannie Dubitsky, for sure. Mm -hmm. yeah. Debbie Hoban, another founder right here in the room, now on our board, Jeannie Dubitsky, the two of the originals. Um, to get those schools going in 1998. It's so it's yeah. been a long time. Trustee Lathan. Thank you. 
Thank you for the presentation. Thank you. And I may have missed this. Um, I see that your numbers for uh, students with disabilities at one is like, at one school is like 15%, another one, another school is around 22%. Mm -hmm. Are you all full inclusion or do you have SCC classes? Full inclusion. Full, okay. Yeah. And are students coming to you all with IEPs or are you all ad identifying students both. at the site? Yeah, both. Okay. So we have students coming with IEPs and a lot of younger students with IEPs at ACA too. Okay. I think that's the, the large increase. A lot of students coming with speech IEPs and things. So we've had a, seen a huge increase actually there. But yes, we get students coming with IEPs. We do interims and bring them in. And then we are also identifying um, students. So uh, ACA numbers have sort of stayed consistent. They sort of shot up over the last four or five years when we took on our own um, responsibilities as LEA for special education. Um, um, and then they've sort of evened out. Yeah. Um, but ACA twos have increased and notice, noticeably in the younger grades. Okay. Um, and then what are, so I noticed the math scores in the person who presented around um, mm -hmm. assessments. Um, shared and it's also, it's also on the graph that there are not uh, the math learning is not um, accelerating as much as the English lang language no, arts learning not. and so what are your initial thoughts about why that is happening like what is instruction like programming all of that yeah we definitely saw a change um, well you know math is always never grows as fast as ELA but we've always you know seen growth a pretty significant growth at, at ACA that's where we've, we've noticed since we took two years off of CASP testing <laughs> may have had a pretty big impact on our kids so we we had one year where we all took off because of the pandemic and then the next year we had an option to take <coughs> off or do it and, and do an internal test ACA did an internal test. ACA two didn't, they did a CASP test. So we actually have a little nice little data there to what that impact might have been, honestly, um, because now you have kids who never had, and we don't really spend a lot of time practicing this test and, and teaching to it or teaching it, honestly, because we have so many other things we're doing. So just not having those two years of practice has, we feel is part, part the reason why we have that impact because the internal measure on stars and our internal measures are showing growth but the CASP is not showing the kind of growth so honestly we're focusing on the test that CASP test the SBAC test and how that is presented to kids um, a Montessori schools don't spend a lot of times so we actually try to avoid computers up to fourth grade but we have to bring them in in third because of that test honestly they try to keep tech like that away from children let their brains develop a little more um, so we're going to look at that very specifically, that test at ACA. So test see if that's having an impact. Yeah. Because our instruction hasn't changed a lot. You know, we're, uh, well, we are going to look at our full math program, just so you know as well. We are looking at, like, what are we missing? You know, what are, what are we missing in this program? Yeah, because yeah, the test is one thing, but I'm thinking of things like number sense or yeah. conceptual understanding, like what is it that you're noticing for your students that may be causing it? That's causing this. Mm -hmm. that, Honestly, we have to do that evaluation and analysis, and that's part of that goal. So we have a WASC goal. It's our number one goal at ACA, and number one is an analyzing what is it that we're not maybe teaching mm -hmm. because we have aligned our curriculum and our assessments to the standards over the course of time, but that doesn't mean teachers teach all of them, right? Mm -hmm. They might leave them off, so we got to look at ourselves. Um, so it's a, the full process will happen at ACA. So pedagogy. Yep, exactly. And then I have a few questions. You said that you don't teach towards necessarily this CASP test. Mm -hmm. So how is it that you measure effectiveness? Well, we, we measure effectiveness in, with internal measures. Well, this test does show effectiveness, yeah. whether we use the test and teach to it. You know, it, when the charter school started, we had the belief that if you do good teaching and you use good materials and you provide what students need, they will do well on tests. <laughs> right. And that has always shown been true at our school. Uh, but when you brought in the computer test, I think we then sort of had to add that sort of piece of how to use a computer. How do you know how to use this and what, how do you do here? And so we've been doing it, but it's been a little more piecemeal. Got it. And are those internal measures in here? I didn't see them. In no. Most of the, the measures that we're using and we're going to share are the CAS test and the STAR results. Internal measures might be a teacher measure, you know, of what a teacher is seeing or an individual. We follow those individual children, so it's not necessarily appropriate for your, for your pa packet, but you're welcome to come 
Got it. Yeah. Yeah. I get, yeah. Yeah. Because I'd I love to write. If that's how you all are measuring success, yeah. I feel like we should be using the same language. Yeah, then. for sure. And we were just talking about this. Um, we're using multiple things. We're using this as well as that. Got it. And how do you all handle cohort effects? Because as I look at, you know, some of the data on here, uh, you can see that the different cohorts of students as they go from, you know, one grade and up, their performance is different from other cohorts. So how do you all think about meeting the needs of these students? Um, because you have such small classes and groups of students in each grade. Yeah, so because we have one class at every level and many students don't leave, mm -hmm. we're looking at the same kids each time they move up. So um, I don't know if that answers your question. So we actually feel like we're seeing growth from those individual kids. It's not a switch in a new class. We're looking at that class. Um, and we can, besides following them sort of individually as well, yeah, I guess what, what I'm saying is it seems like the experience of like a kid, let's say a kid in fourth grade and a kid in fifth grade right now are having different experiences as they go to fifth, as the, this kid goes to sixth, seventh, eighth, and this kid goes to fifth, sixth, and seventh. Uh, we're not seeing they're having huge differences. What we're seeing is that as they, basically what we're seeing is as they start in third grade, sometimes they drop it fourth because there's a mm -hmm. switch in our school between third and fourth. So we go from primary and elementary and third to fourth. So sometimes we'll see a drop in scores. That's a new teacher. Mm -hmm. That's a new level. Mm -hmm. And then when they're in fifth, fourth, fifth, and sixth, we see a growth. And then seventh and eighth, we see a growth. So the only changes we've seen, I think, over the last few years with the pandemic, mm -hmm. they have not been as much as high a growth as we've normally seen. Um, but I will say that um, we are looking at some changes, that those kinds of changes to see if there's ways that we can sort of improve that for kids and also follow. Got it. And then um, you all have here your rates of uh, special education students um, listed as a six-year measure. Is there a reason why it's listed as a six-year measure? And is that like looking at six years ago versus now in terms of that percentage that's 8% um, <laughs> to 15% uh, and 11% to 22%? It's like about 10 slides in. <laughs> Hmm. There you go. Yeah, I think that's because that's when we became our own LEA was six years ago. So, so has that increase in students been like gradual or have we seen like dramatic increases or I guess I'm wondering why, why it is we're viewing it from the six year. Uh, I think landscape. because we've been responsible for it. Prior to uh, six years ago, the district was responsible for those numbers, responsible for edu those children, responsible for the teacher, everything. Mm -hmm. And we were really only like teachers involved, you know what I mean? We really had no a say um, on, on sort of the program and what we could offer kids. Um, so we're just kind of showing you over our responsibility. Yeah, but the, the growth I think has been casual. I mean, uh, sorry, slow in general. Got it. And then the last question I have is just, um, uh, how do you all think about whether, uh, when you look at positive discipline, how do you all think about its effectiveness? How do you know that's being effective? And what kinds of things do you all do to improve on those positive discipline practices? Well, I think in the classroom, if you come to the school, you can see immediately it's effective <laughs> because it, it feels like a different place than maybe a normal you know, school. There's a, there's a sense of community and a sense of connection that kids feel. This is, these are words from the WASC visit. They were just like immediately feel a sense of joy. And I think that's partly because this community is built um, where kids know they're cared about. They know that we care about them. There's no ifs, ands, or buts. We're small enough that we can know everyone. Um, I don't know if I answered the second part of your question, which is? Um, how do you all improve on some of these positive discipline practices? I think our biggest improvement is training teachers and reminding ourselves mm -hmm. to reread, reread, to make sure that we're reaching out to kids who do need, do, do have mis um, they do have these mistaken goals. Did you want to add something with your data? I did. I was just going to say one of the ways we know it's effective is by our discipline statistics. Mm -hmm. And if you see that later in the packet, this year ACA has suspended one student, AC2 has suspended four, which is high for us. So in comparison, that is a very small percentage of students. And I think that gives you an indication of the kind of behaviors that we have on our campus and the effectiveness of positive discipline. That's true. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much for uh, taking the time to present to us yeah, today. Yeah, thank really you appreciate for the it. questions. I really appreciate it. It made me think. All right. Great. Moving on to uh, 6A public comments, uh, individuals to address the board regarding items not on the agenda from the public. Uh, first, we have Candace Wen.
Good evening, board members, and good evening, Superintendent Anello. My name is Candace Wen. I'm an investigative reporter with NBC Bay Area News, mm -hmm. and I'm here to speak to Superintendent Anello. Uh, you have not directly responded to any of my calls or my emails for an upcoming news story. You have received numerous complaints about Kenneth Turnage, and I want to ask you, has he been disciplined? We can't talk about personnel. He is accused of putting one of his employees' desk on a roof using district resources. What was your reaction to that? Several employees feel he has not been properly disciplined because he has a close relationship to you as well as to your husband, a former Antioch police chief. How do you respond to that? Superintendent Anello, let me know if you change your mind about commenting. It's important to us that we get your side in our story. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is Sharon Vela. Do I? Hi. I know a few of you. I started teaching in Antioch in 1971 mm -hmm. to 2005. I taught music education, a lot of places. And I'm at the charter school. And since I was coming here, I, I part-time teach now, and I have the instrumental music. Since I was here to support them, I thought, I'll take a minute. And I just have to say this, that you were asking about children. Uh, how do you tell if how this positive discipline works? One of the reasons I think I was invited to teach at this school a long time ago was that I worked with some teachers who had that, Debbie Hoban, uh, for one. And one of your special ed um, teachers that used to come to our school, she told me one day, because we're both part-time, but we're chatting, she said, you know the children at these two schools, because she went to both, she said, they're really pretty. And then she stopped, she says, no, they're really happy. And she just put it right in a sentence, just like that. And that's what it is. And I've enjoyed having that feeling. And in my senior <laughs> years, now that since I started in 1966 teaching, I've gone through a lot of kids. I came here, music education. We get nervous when we hear about budgets cuts. Every music educator, not me personally, but just the philosophy of the values of music ed. And when you hear, read about positive discipline, that's what happens in a band, an orchestra, a choir. It becomes the community for the child. And I have seen it uh, since I had these huge groups all the years, and they'd feed other schools. And that became a community, but you have to start it in elementary. You have provided instruments. I know they're out there. And I know teaching, we had people retire. That's difficult. But if you start them when they're young and they get, get caught and play an instrument of some sort, they walk out very proudly. They keep doing that. We did a survey of Antioch High School and Antioch Junior High students in the late 1990s on their uh, attendance at both schools. And we took the top music groups. They, their attendance compared to the school attendance, ADA, brought in oh, in the 90s over $30,000 more each year because they went to school. Not that children don't go to school for math or go to school for English, but they will go for their marching band. I just looked on the website. There they are, front page, marching band. They go to school for marching band, but they take math and they take English and everything else. And as you're looking at your budget and money, and I'd be glad to help, having taught a lot and been on a lot of um, committees with Music Ed, how you can use the people. I know you're shorthanded. But if you're looking at thinning or stretching uh, with music education, I'd be glad to offer some ideas. But I'd like you to not be quick to put that on the first place to look at saving money. Thank you. So thank you. Next, we have Amanda Freitas. Good evening. Um, I'm here again tonight because I continue to be frustrated and let down by our SPED department. 
um, not just for my own son, um, but also the students um, at Fremont as a whole. Uh, my son had his annual meeting in March, and his, first of all, I don't understand how our meetings are primarily made up of people who could not pick my son out of a lineup if we were to put five kids in front of them. They wouldn't be able to go, oh, that's Connor Freitas. But they're the ones conducting the meeting telling me what is best for him. Um, also sitting in his last IEP meeting, it was not conducted in a linear fashion. It jumped all over the place. And being someone who has sat in their fair share of IEP meetings, it was very hard to follow. One of the things they kept telling me is, oh, we'll, we'll address this at his triennial. It's due next month. I was a little confused because he had a reassessment last year for um, at least his psych because um, I had a lot of concerns last year and he hadn't had it done since he was in preschool and he was in kindergarten last year and some changes had happened. Um, I expressed my concerns to um, Kelly Quinn and the response I got back and I, I'm sorry, I'm having a hard time recalling her name. I believe it's Sharon. I can't think of her last name. She's awesome. Yes, sorry, I, it's been a long day running around. Um, the response I got was, oh, oh sorry, I apologize. Um, Cause he didn't have any speech goals in his IEP that I was given to sign. So I said that I was concerned that there was no speech goals. And I was told, oh, he's gonna be reassessed. We'll do everything at the triennial. You could do him a big favor by signing this IEP now and just saying you don't agree with those goals. But there's no viable goals. I also found out the things that the person running the meeting, again, who doesn't know Connor, the things she was saying that his aide had reported, she hadn't actually reported. They were reporting a, that his behavior was improving and it's not improving. He's actually regressed since the beginning of the school year. Um, he just finished his speech evaluation and now we're just doing a speech amendment. We're not doing a triennial. So now we're just ignoring the whole fact that I have issues with his social emotional goals and his behavior intervention plan. All the things that they said that we would circle back to, we're not, circle backing, we're not circling back to now. Um, it's not, my son's not the only one who's being disserviced. We have teachers who put in requests or referrals for their students for speech back in August. And here we are the middle of April and they're still not receiving services. These students, I. I buddy with a kindergarten classroom and there's a little girl in there that talks to me all the time. And might as I try, I cannot understand what she's saying and she so desperately wants to be understood. And here we are middle of April of her kindergarten year and she still doesn't have services. We really need to do something to change this for our students. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have Tiki. All right, if Tiki's not here, we'll go ahead and move on to Tiki, right Tiki. oh, perfect, great. Hi, sorry about that. No worries. Um, thank you guys for your service. Thanks for being here. My name is Tiki Flo. Um, I'm here as a community member, a parent, and um, I stand with Three Imagine Antioch as well. So I, I had a few other things, but before I go there, I, I, I enjoyed her, um, I enjoyed the, present, the presentation. Um, my question is, because they were talking about the discipline and everything, and um, can we get some of that in our public schools? And then, <laughs> um, the, the success, do we, do we question our public schools about our success, about their success? I was trying to find our testing, and I don't know if you guys haven't updated it, but it said 2018. In 2018, we was at 36%, I believe, in math skills. Um, what, 46? We was never over 50-something in reading skills. So my question is, are you guys going to question those that teach our public schools as well or as hard as y'all just did that charter school back there, right? Because um, our students are failing and we just got this bond passed to revitalize our community. And I understand students need a, face, a safe, clean environment. It helps with their learning. I understand that. But can we focus now on their education? And it's not just Antioch. This is a California statewide thing. So that means you, 
and the Board of Supervisors and everybody in Sacramento have to get on one page so that as a California, we won't look like we dumb. We like low on the totem pole and it makes no sense when we're supposed to be in a land opportunity. You know, I'm from the, uh, Detroit and in California, it looks like, oh, we're living, we're living the best life. I've been here 12 years. I feel like California is overrated, to be honest, right? The school district, I'm not gonna say, it's not better than Michigan, because it is. I promise you it is. But I have three graduates who have four degrees. They have master degrees, but can't find a job. I don't understand. So what's going wrong? Where's the, where's the, um, where's the gap from the education and our students actually succeeding in life. Because they, they went to school, they didn't graduated, they didn't did everything, but they can't find something, you know, that, you know, that their career is gonna uh, move them forward. So also, and then um, Antioch, we are Hispanic. We have more Hispanic individuals here, especially in the schools. So when I was in an ad hoc committee, a, um, a student said that when they test out, as far as the non-English speakers, when they test out, that test is difficult. So I think somebody needs to um, look at that as well. Thank you. Is that my time? Yeah, mm -hmm. thank you. We'll move on to 6B, individuals to address the board regarding items not on the agenda from district employees. Uh, we have Amber Dagan. Hello. I am here to um, once again advocate for Fremont because somebody needs to do it. Um, we have been the recipients of a grant for a while the ELSB grant, and through that grant, we have been, um, we have had the luck of having three awesome reading intervention specialists at our school, and um, I'm here to advocate that they stay, because uh, we need them. Um, this district has, I know that this district has a tier three problem, that you have too many people that are trying to qualify for SPED services. Well, let me tell you as a classroom teacher why that is. You don't invest in tier one or tier two. That's why. You don't invest in it. If you invested in tier one and in tier two, you would not have a tier three problem. So let me give you some ideas on what you can do to invest in tier one and tier two, because they're important. Reading intervention teachers at schools, and more than one, that is going to be a huge help. Um, the number of students in my school that have been able to receive services with our reading intervention teachers, I can't understate, I can't overstate how important they have been to the growth that we have experienced at Fremont. Um, another thing that I would like to talk about is dyslexia. Um, statistics show that 15 to 20% of our population has dyslexia. So I would like to ask this district, I already know the answer to this, and I'm sure you know the answer to this, but I'm gonna be rhetorical for a second here. What tests do we have to screen for dyslexia? The answer is none. What tests do we, what do we have to even address dyslexia if we come across it and we find it? The answer is none, we have nothing. We don't have any way of screening for dyslexia. We don't have any way of mitigating it when we do figure it out. And that's if we're even willing to say that a student has dyslexia, which is extremely hard in and of itself. When you have 15 to 20% statistically of a population that is likely to have dyslexia, wouldn't it stand that that would be reflected in our student population? Doesn't that make sense, logical sense? And yet we are hanging them out to dry by providing nothing to them. There is a whole lot we could be doing that doesn't involve the special ed department to help mitigate the effects of dyslexia because it is a spectrum. Part of that could be professional development for teachers to understand what dyslexia is, specific training for reading intervention teachers so that they know what dyslexia is and can mitigate, the, mitigate that as a tier two intervention. That in and of itself, I can't even tell you how important that would be to our school if we did something like that. I hope you guys will actually consider this because I'm speaking from my heart here and we need help. Please stop telling us to do it alone without any help. 
please help us. Thank you. Now, before we move on to item uh, seven, district reports, I know we have a number of people here um, that are from AEA for the AEA uh, tentative agreement. I'm wondering if it would be okay with the board uh, if someone would like to make a motion to suspend the rules and move that item up to now? I'll make the motion uh, to suspend the rules and move the item up. Second. All right, so it's been moved and seconded uh, to suspend the rules to move up item 11A, which is the disclosure and ratification of the tentative agreement between Antioch Unified School District and Antioch um, Education Association. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say no. And the motion passes. So we'll go ahead and move on to uh, item 11A first. Yes, good evening, board president, uh, board members, uh, superintendent, and members of the public. Uh, we're pleased uh, to bring forward the tentative, set of, tentative settlement agreement between AEA and the district for the 2023-24 school year. Uh, the components of the uh, settlement agreement are contained within the board documents. Uh, primarily, there is a 7% a retroactive increase to July 1st, uh, which will be, again, once affirmed tonight, would go into effect in May for our teachers with retroactive payments coming in June. Uh, the process simply has to play out that way. There is also a significant increase to the medical benefits coverage for our employees. It is a 100% coverage for either single uh, employee plus one or family coverage for all of our full-time employees. Uh, that is very important for us, uh, for our teacher staff. We know that AEA uh, had a component and a request to ensure that their members were fully covered for medical service. So again, after some time and working with them uh, through the process, through mediation as well, uh, we did reach settlement agreements over the Easter or the spring break. Uh, and so we're pleased to again bring this to before you, uh, thankful for the work from both sides, uh, the district's team and AEA, uh, to bring this settlement to you. Thank you, Dr. Martinez. Before we get to any questions that we might have, we do have a public comment on this um, from Kendra Borja. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much. I'm the bargaining chair for the AEA, and it was a very long, difficult <clears throat> journey that we went on this year, but I think we're very happy with the settlement we have reached and hope that we can continue to build on it, and we ask that you vote yes to ratify it. Um, our members finished voting today with a 97.9% .9 approval rating, so thank you very much. Thank you. Is there any questions or discussions on this? Otherwise, I will entertain a motion to approve the tentative agreement. I move, agree, uh, I move to approve the motion as presented. Second. All right, it's mm -hmm. been properly moved and seconded to approve the tentative agreement um, to ratify the tentative agreement between the Antioch Unified School District and the Antioch Education Association for the contract uh, for the term of July 1st, 2023 through June 30th, 2024 as presented uh, and approve the AB 1200 disclosure document pertaining to all employees of the district, including CSEA, AMA, and AMA senior management groups. Uh, any discussion? All right, all in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say no. And the motion passes. Mm -hmm. Congratulations to all of the district staff that worked so hard on that and all of um, our uh, certificated uh, classified teachers that have worked so hard throughout this entire bargaining process as well. Great, so moving back to item 7A, we'll move on to uh, Measure B, Citizens Bond Oversight Committee and Next Steps. Good evening, I would like to introduce um, Katie Dobson, who is our Bond Legal Counsel from Jones Hall, who will be doing a presentation um, on the Bond and the Citizens Oversight Committee, as well as we'll, we've included some next steps on um, the Bond. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I'm very happy to be here tonight, and congratulations on the success of Measure B. Um, I have... Uh, perfect. Okay. Thank Sorry. you. Nope. 
Oops, I did the wrong thing. Sorry. Here we go. Sorry about that. Uh, so, um, election certification. On March 5th, 57.85% of district voters approved Measure B, which is more than the 55% required under Proposition 39. The county has certified the results, and pursuant to the elections code, the district also needs to certify the results. So that is a resolution before you this evening. <coughs> I'm going to get this. Sorry about that. Uh, so Proposition 39 requires that a project list be included, and we discussed that previously when you adopted the election resolution. A project list was presented to voters, and that was um, that's one of the accountability measures under Proposition 39. Other account accountability measures include the production of annual audits, and oversight by a committee of independent citizens. So the stated intent of having a citizens oversight committee is that vigorous efforts are undertaken to ensure the expenditure of bond proceeds are legal. The taxpayers can participate directly in the oversight of bond expenditures. Committees can promptly alert the public as to any waste or improper expenditure of bond funds and any unauthorized expenditures are investigated, prosecuted, and courts act swiftly to enjoin any improper expenditures. The Education Code sets forth specific requirements for the makeup of an oversight committee. Um, you can see those here. There are five required positions, um, and then there are two at-large community members. And when you are selecting your committee members, there's a process that the district goes through, so I will turn it over to Liz to explain that. Yes. So um, previously, with our previous bond measure, um, the district advertised um, on their website and working with um, site administrators to uh, submit or to distribute applications. Um, I believe that they reviewed applications and then selected them, but it, it's my understanding and the, the research that I did that we basically had one application per um, required category, so they didn't have to determine one or the other. Um, but just for future reference, um, there's this there's the seven different areas that we have to, uh, that are required that was on the previous slide, um, but we could have more. So if we had more applicants that came forward next time, um, we could have more. And then the district um, would make recommendations to the board and with the applications on filling all the different categories that are required. Thank you. So you already have an existing oversight committee um, under Measure C and the bylaws for that committee were last amended in 2013. So also before you tonight are amended bylaws adding Measure B oversight to the existing committee um, and that will be later in the agenda. So the purpose of the Citizens Oversight Committee as set forth in the Education Code is to inform the public about the expenditure of bond revenues and to actively review and report on the proper expenditure of taxpayers' money. So this committee is a post-expenditure review they inform the public by meeting, reviewing, and reporting, but they are not a decision-making committee. Decisions about bond projects are purely board decisions. The district's responsibilities under the law are to recruit committee members, to provide facilities and technical or administrative support for meetings. Uh, district staff attends meetings, reports on the spending, and takes minutes, which are then made publicly available. Currently, there are three vacancies on the existing committee, uh, the member of a taxpayers association, member of a senior citizens organization, and an at-large member. So the district is currently actively recruiting and accepting applications to fill those positions. So the next step, after those two um, items that are, will be before you this evening, the next step is the issuance of the bonds. And the issuance process takes uh, approximately three months from start to finish. And at the end of May, we will be presenting to you an issuance resolution. And then we will go through all the steps that Superintendent Anello described earlier. And the plan now is in early September for you to receive those bond funds. Uh, the election resolution that you adopted last year did include reimbursement language required by the IRS if you're going to reimburse yourself from tax-exempt bond proceeds. 
So any expenditures that you've made on projects that were included on that voter approved project list can, um, as of September 9th and forward, can then be reimbursed. Mm. And that will happen at the time of issuance of the first series of bonds. So tonight you will certify the election results, approve the oversight committee bylaws, and then continue re recruiting those new committee members. And then at the end of May, consider authorizing the issuance of bonds. Are there any questions I can answer? Any questions? I have a question. Uh, yes, Trustee Lathan. Um, one question is how do, and I don't know if it's for you or um, Ms. Robbins, um, but how are we, we're, like where are the applications? Um, I know of some community members who are interested in applying and I didn't know, even know where to direct them to. Oh. Our website. We have it listed under our website under, um, under, uh, let me remember. I think it says community, community, and then it says um, bond measures, and then under bond measures is citizens oversight. But we can actually move it to the front of our um, page and have it so floating in the front and maybe do like a, an announcement out to the school sites to show their, let their community know. But we'll probably have to do, like in my previous district, we also did it in the newspaper. We published it in the newspaper. Yeah, that was going to be my next question. Yeah. Thank you, Ms. Robbins, yeah. is how are we advertising? And I know that's just not up to the district, but up to the board to have a discussion about that. What I'm finding, and I shared this publicly before, is uh, when the city council has, they have a new committee around uh, policing in Antioch, and they had such a beautiful process to, to uh, recruit people. And I'm like, we need to have a process other than we stick something on a web page and it took you a couple of seconds to figure out how to tell me to get there. And it's not about you, Ms. Robbins, but I mean, just imagine if you're saying this and you know where it is, a community member looking on our website, they don't know how to find it. And so uh, we need to do a better job as a board discussing how we communicate um, our need for committee members um, and actually come up with the process because that's not a process just to go online and apply and that's not a process um, or not an effective process. <laughs> it's a truncated one. Um, and so I say, I like what Ms. Robbins said about um, putting the application on the front page like the front the floater of the website putting it in, an, in the newspaper, social media, like we can post something on social media as board members and then actively recruit ourselves. Um, and that's what I've been doing, but I didn't know where to send people, right, once they are interested. So now I know. Okay. Okay. Um, so that was one. Um, and then I don't know how you all feel about um, – an interview process um, like the city council did around their committee. But but one thing I can say is like you're sharing, like we only have one application per <laughs> per area and that's really concerning. But I think partly it's because we haven't been clear about the need for a committee. Um, and so we need to, just our communication strategy needs to be strengthened. So I just want to know what other board members feel about feel about that. Any other questions? Question. Yeah, Vice President Rocha. Um, I asked yeah. a question. I'm sorry. My question I'm is, sorry. what do other board members feel about that? About strengthening our communications? Do you all have any ideas about it um, and what that could look like? I think it's worth putting to the powers that be to share with us what you come up with. We are the powers that be. Well, yeah, I think... Uh, the person is doing oh. it. <laughs> Okay. You know, I think effective communication is definitely one way to get the word out. Uh, defining what that effective communication is and how it looks and sort of how we reach it, because again, any policy, that, or I'm sorry, any process that we develop is going to have some sort of level of limitation. Uh, so depending on the population that we're looking to target, maybe looking and understanding how that population sort of works. And this is not necessarily just for this. Uh, sort of oversight committee, but just in general, how we communicate, how we engage the public, there are limitations. If I'm, you know, if I'm not a digital native, if I'm not, you know, on the web, whatever that my limitations are, um, you know, the, we may not necessarily have the most effective uh, communication strategy. So incorporating multi sort of uh, pronged approaches to uh, communication would be effective. So I would, I would definitely support uh, what uh, trustee uh, Dr. Jag is suggesting. 
Yeah, I mean, I definitely agree that I think there's opportunities to improve our communication. Um, I'm wondering if this is a um, maybe longer conversation that we should uh, spend a little bit more time thinking intentionally and because uh, I guess, you know, some of the other questions I have is right now, what do we have in the application process and what are the things that we're asking people to submit to us and are those good <laughs> ways of seeing if those are good fits for, um, you know, this role? And so, um, so I wonder if that's also kind of part of that discussion that I think we maybe need to have about, um, you know, this process, um, you know, because I think... Um, and I guess I'll ask this question, is the, uh, I know that the composition of the members of the committee is specified uh, in uh, education code or, um, but are things like the application and selection process, are those specified in education code or is that for us as a board to set? That is for you as a board to decide. The law is silent on how you, ex how you um, solicit applications and select members. Yeah, so I guess when I think about communication, I think, first of all, do we have our process set right? Mm -hmm. And then once we have that, I think that can also be an important piece that informs how it is that we're going to get this out to people. Because it's one thing to tell people to, uh, you know, fill out their information and another thing to tell them to, you know, fill out their information and their resume or fill out their information resume and then mm -hmm. an essay on their qualifications, you know, or a video or, you know, thinking about what do we, it, what do we want from the public when making these decisions on who gets on the board, and I think that informs our communication uh, strategy. So that's kind of my thoughts on, I think, uh, you know, this would be a good thing to bring, uh, to be intentional about discussing perhaps at our next board meeting, if that makes sense. Yes, yeah, so the challenge is we have to have certain things done um, very soon. And so um, I'm not sure if folks are up to, and I would be up to, um, like, a, I don't know if it would be a special board meeting, but just a time to come together and look at the information, because I haven't looked at the application. Um, I know you talked about bylaws. I haven't read the bylaws. My idea tonight, my understanding was we were coming to get information about um, these things. And so, um, yeah. Yeah, so I guess a uh, point of clarification, um, when we're approving these bylaws, is there any kind of regulation as far as to our ability to amend these bylaws? Yes, the bylaws can be amended at any time by the board, and they were last amended in 2013 to add Measure C, so um, we haven't made any significant changes other than to add Measure B to the purview of the committee. Got it. Okay. And before us today is not... Um, those applica any applications for Correct. putting on the committee. Correct. My question is... Yes, Vice President Rocha. My question to me is that it has three definite um, na numbers or names. One is Taxpayers Association. Mm -hmm. Does that mean that you're going to go straight to an organization that is taxpayers? Or does taxpayers mean everybody that lives in the city? No, someone who's active in, a, in an official taxpayer organization like Howard Jarvis is a very popular right. one. Um, and so one effective way to fill that position can be to go directly to the Taxpayers Association and ask if anyone's Okay, and the other one that I was wondering, senior citizens organizations. Yes. Do we have a citizen, ci senior citizen? The only one I can think of is the one that we have downtown, uh, uh, you know, senior center. And they're not an organization, they just come there. So even a member of AARP, that's mm -hmm. considered a senior citizen So if you're carrying a card so of AARP, you're, you could be one. Correct. All right. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I mean. I got to figure out what it, what it means. Right. And these are legally defined. Yeah, uh, they're defined. Yeah. Because the only one that I see that's open to anybody is at, at large. That's correct. That's the only one. So well, there are see. some. You already have four active members who are filling. I those understand that, yeah. but they're already there. Correct. So of the three, I only see at large as an opportunity, unless you are a carrying card. Mm -hmm. I don't know who at other senior organization there is, and the taxpayer is another one that's interesting. Yes, and I will say so just how do we define it? Right, and they are not defined in the law. It doesn't say exactly what it, what constitutes a taxpayer's association. So. Um, there is some discretion there, but I will um, just add that statewide, those two roles, the Taxpayers Association and Senior Citizen Organization, are historically difficult to fill. Correct. Yes. Uh, I mean, I'm just bringing that up, that we only really have one at-large member to get the community involved. The other ones are limited. 
Yeah, and I guess a point of clarification with, with that question, the law doesn't stop us from expanding the size of the committee, That's correct? correct? Mm -hmm. It's at least seven mm -hmm. members. Got it. Yeah. So we could, if we expand the different roles and other uh, opportunities for people to serve on that committee, potentially, if that's something that, I, as a board, we decide. Can I ask a follow-up? Yes, follow Trustee Lewis. Uh, so is that, is that expansion based on the ratio? So for example, you know, if we increase the at-large by three, do we then have to in turn increase the other uh, groups by three as well? No. You do not have to. No. The law is silent, so you can add whoever you wish. What about, what about a quorum? You, you do need to think about having a quorum because you need a quorum. That's kind of that's the underlining. That's, that's, the, and and that's been the hardest one to do. Doing that. Because you have to have representative from each group. Correct. Yeah, you have to have a quorum to have a meeting. Yeah, but those are two different questions. Quorum is just sort of a, a sort of a representation or a percentage of the total population. Right. What I'm asking is, do we have to have representation from all of these identified groups? That's different than quorum. Not to hold a meeting. You just need a quorum to hold. A but meeting. to make decisions. No, not to make decisions either. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering, if I can. Yeah, yeah, um, superintendent. I'm wondering, um, trustee, Doctor. Lathan, if it, I know we have a number of subcommittees, but I don't see this as a long-term subcommittee, mm -hmm. but maybe if there would be two uh, board members who I'd be happy to work with Ms. Robbins on this with those two board members and just kind of go through what we have and then they could report back to the larger board um, as to that. Yeah, I don't mind volunteering to do that. Yep. If the board good with that? At least to look through information, yeah. and, and they may have already done it, but <laughs> but yes. um, looking through information, reading the bylaws, looking at the application process, the questions, and then also starting to do some recruitment. So now that we know, for example, to actually contact a taxpayer's organization, mm -hmm. I'm sure you can, you can give uh, Ms. Robbins a list, or she may have a list, and then we can start contacting them. Like some things we just have to do, because we can send it through the schools, but as uh, Trustee Rocha said, some of the parents may or may not be a part of these organizations, so we need to reach out directly. Okay, so I'll, I'll contact So you. can I get a head, head nod of the board if there, that sounds like a good plan? Yeah, I guess two things that I, I wonder if the board's also okay with in terms of, or to specify a little bit more. So I mean, I, I think first, if anyone else is interested in that, I think mm -hmm. it'd be good to call it out now. Otherwise, I'm happy to serve in that spot. Um, and I think the intention would be that um, this would happen prior to our next board meeting. Because I yes. think, yes. I, I don't think it would take very long. I think mm -hmm. uh, we also, right, had applications before us that we put off because we wanted to review that process. So I do want to be respectful mm -hmm. of that and make sure that we're working through this process uh, mm -hmm. as quickly as possible. So um, if they, adding that kind of piece there, if that's okay with everyone. I'll join on the committee. Okay. okay sure. You want to serve? Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Great. Um, any other questions? I have just one more quick question. Right now, what's our cadence for reviewing applications? Like when an application comes in, um, when is that reviewed and when is that brought to us? Um, do we have a, a current, like, more um, well-defined process at this point? Because I guess I wonder, like, um, you know, in cases where one person submits uh, and maybe someone else was about to submit or could have submitted, um, you know, it's a little bit unclear how quickly maybe someone was thinking about also applying. I don't know that we have a process, and I don't know what the pr previous process was. I think uh, for the, the ones that we brought to you, uh, like, a month ago, we opened up the application process for individuals, and then we, we basically took but what we had at the time before the board meeting. So we didn't necessarily have a cutoff. It's kind of open until filled, yeah. and then we had the applications that we brought to you. Got it. Okay. Yeah. So I think that's something you know for the subcommittee to kind of decide, but I think I would encourage us to think about um, defining maybe either due dates or things like that to make sure that um, people that the process is clear to anyone who may be interested and maybe was thinking about yeah, it. Yeah, definitely if we publish this and we go out and advertise, we would say by this date so that at least we can put a timeline together and Just know that when we have the applications, it's going to be a, a cutoff date. Yeah. Trustee Lewis? Uh, so and then Vice President Rogers. Okay. Spurred by that question, is there a, because this bond I'm assuming is a 30-year bond, correct? Mm -hmm. And so is there time limitations on uh, the length of time one person can choose to stay or can be on, because yeah. again, those are two different things. That's those are already defined. Yes, that, that, that's defined in the law. The maximum a person can serve is three consecutive terms, and they're two-year terms. 
So six years. And um, the committee does not live on for the life of the bonds. It's just while you're spending the proceeds. And that should be done within three years of when you issue the bonds under tax law. So depending on how many issuances um, you end up having under Measure B, this is a, it's a fairly limited committee. That's President Roger. I, I would just mention, thinking about when we did the other one, B, it seemed like we had trouble trying to get people to stay on. And I think it was a limited amount of money, and we had gone through the main purpose of it. Mm -hmm. And then that straggling at the end is where we had trouble, and then we couldn't even get quorums yeah. uh, for people to vote. Uh, now I think this is exciting because we're talking about $190 million, and I think people are all interested about, wow. But I, I'm hoping that they understand the amount of time that's put into it, because this is, this is it. I mean, as volunteer, it's not just one day or one night or one meeting. It's many meetings. Ms. It is. that The requirement is that the committee meets at least once annually. And typically during busy construction periods, I would recommend that they meet quarterly uh, so that they can review all the money going out the door, but they produce one annual report. So mm -hmm. it's That's important for them to know. Yeah. And this participation on the, uh, this committee is voluntary. It's unpaid. Correct. Yeah. Unpaid. Right. Yeah. Yes. Great. Any other questions? All right. Well, thank you so much. Thank Appreciate you, you taking time to answer again. our questions and thank you. Of course. Thank you. Thank you. We, this is non-voting. Great. Uh, moving on to 7B, reading program uh, update. Uh, I know we have comments on here. We'll do the presentation, and then we'll do the comments, and then we'll have board discussion. All right. Well, I would like to welcome up to the podium um, our uh, Miss Deborah Malin. She is our educational services coordinator, primarily focused on literacy efforts. And so she is here this evening to provide you an update on our reading, reading programs and initiatives at the elementary level. Thank you. Uh, good evening, President Hernandez, trustees, Superintendent Anello, cabinet, all of you. Glad to be here. Um, I, we are, and I guess I'll say I am, on behalf of Ed Services, excited to showcase some of the really good things that are happening in our Tier 1 uh, knowledge base and our instruction in ELA for uh, elementary schools. Um, as it was brought up uh, with the tiers, and we'll go into the PowerPoint right away, but with the tiers, that Tier 1 is super important because if you have kids who are not uh, successful on a regular basis. We don't have a uh, tier one. We have, a, we have an issue with our daily instruction needing to be maybe going in a different direction or more knowledge needed to be able to be helpful and more materials needed for that. So we're excited that that's where we're going as Antioch Unified. This one? Okay. All right. So um, these are, we, AUSD does partner with UC Berkeley um, with the California Reading and Literature Project, CRLP, uh, with the results program that is for TK and second grade teachers in AUSD. The training was fairly uh, significant a while ago, post uh, pre-pandemic, um, and CRLP provided us with many, many um, bases of knowledge, but it didn't always provide us with all the materials that we needed to then put that into place causing a bit maybe of an implementation gap, okay? But we were able to start to get our knowledge around foundational reading. Um, we do continue to train our new teachers when they come in. So any of our TK through second grade teachers at the start of the year go through the CRLP training um, so that we can ensure that they have that base knowledge. Uh, the assessments that we currently use, uh, these are the ones that we're talking through. The BPST is part of CRLP. It's the basic phonics and skills test, and it, it is administered K through 2, and in some cases, K through 3, as well as in some schools, our fourth and fifth graders who had not passed the BPST are then also assessed so that they can continue to get what they need in those missing components. The IWT is called the Irregular Word Test. It is K through 2 also, and again, at some schools that continues on. That is our high frequency words, making sure that we know the ones that are the most important to help our students read. We do chapter tests and unit tests. Those are done by teachers and sometimes grade levels. And then, of course, we have the CAS, which we have talked about, and the iReady diagnostic that we use K through 5 um, for our ongoing ELA as well. 
Um, MTSS is the multi-tiered system of support, and these are those tiers that were talked about. Tier one is classroom core instruction with differentiated instruction. Tier two is also classroom core instruction, but we mainly think of it as some additional help in the form of intervention groups layered in with tier one. And by tier three, we have individual students layered with tier one and tier two and beyond. You may remember um, reading recovery and heroes being presented. Those would fall into the tier three category, okay? Moving forward, based on uh, the current data, specifically the BPST and the IWT, which have been the main sources for us to collect our foundational reading um, scores, along with teacher feedback, it has become clear that AUSD would benefit from more structured literacy, especially in tier one. Um, we needed to gain a deeper understanding of uh, the foundations of reading and how those foundations work. Um, and so we have ventured into those waters as an entire district, all 15 schools. Um, we are working on that um, and working towards having a systematic, explicit phonic-based reading program uh, that, along with the listening comprehension side that's going to be explained in just a moment. Um, we also have really started to look at the science of reading, and um, the science of reading is not a curriculum. The science of reading is a body of work that goes through and has been around for a long time. Those of you in education know of Scarsborough's Rope, that when it came out I wasn't sure I really understood it all the way, um, and I've been doing this for a long time. Um, but it is about the idea that we need the big five ideas of phonemic awareness, of phonics, of fluency, of vocabulary, and then what's all kind of lumped together as comprehension. We're learning more and more about what comprehension really means. Um, it is important for us to have this baseline knowledge as an entire group so that we can move collectively, which is why the goal for 2024-25 has been around professional development uh, in the form of um, our, all of our elementary school administrators, principals, and vice principals, as well as all of our reading teachers have uh, participated in a book study on a book called Shifting the Balance. Um, this is what the cover looks like. Um, we have done the entire book with those, with those groups. And then for K through uh, six at our elementary teachers and Many of our prep teachers as well have participated in um, the knowledge that we're doing chapter one together. I have gone and done the professional development for chapter one um, at 11 schools so far myself. There are three schools that are doing it on their own and by the end of the year, all 15 schools will have had ch time with chapter one, which is laying the foundation for what is reading comprehension and reimagining it. This is one of the big things that comes out of it. Um, it's called the simple view of reading and it is an equation and it's very powerful once understood. So the first part is this part called read, word reading. Word reading is what you think of for phonics, for decoding, for phonemic awareness, which is things you do with your eyes closed, like you manipulate sounds, you don't have to see the letter and know the letter, that's called phonemic awareness. Then we have phonics and then our high frequency words. Most all of that falls under word reading. The second part to the equation is called listening comprehension. It might also be called language comprehension or literacy comprehension. You'll hear it with multiple uses of that term. And that's when we think of things like vocabulary, background knowledge, um, reading strategies, uh, syntax, all those other parts that come. And they all come from Scarsborough Rope also. But this is the part that's been pretty big for us they equal to reading comprehension, which means reading a comprehension is an outcome. We often wanna say we need to work on reading comprehension. Well, we need to be working on both of these parts to be able to get to reading comprehension. And as a multiplier, one times one equals one, but one times one half is gonna equal one half. So if we're only really good at decoding, but we're not good at listening comprehension, we can't get to reading comprehension. And if we're not so good at word reading or phonics, 
and we're really good at listening comprehension, we're still not going to get to reading comprehension because we need them both. Without both of them, we can't get to reading comprehension. And that's what this chapter one has really done. It's given us all a place to talk about it and to start to understand it together. Uh, the simple view of reading, back with that. Here is how we are um, addressing it. Um, as a district, we also purchased, and I have them here for you if you would like to see them, we have purchased um, tools for us to be able to use because once we understand it, we need to have the tools to be able to implement it. Otherwise, we have an implementation gap. If we don't understand it or we don't have the tools, it's real hard to move it along. So the first one right here under phonological awareness is called a program called Hagerty. Hagerty is all phoneme phonological awareness where you fly. It's a second program, the University of Florida Literacy and Institute Foundations. And that has just a little bit of it. I'll show it in just a second. The next one is under phonics. And for phonics, we're really using something called UFLY Foundations. This is all starting for next year. Um, with it being K2 for the whole class and then being used as th in third grade as a possible intervention. We also are using phonics in the form of secret stories, which are all about ways to help our brains kind of remember the letters that go together. Let me show you. This one right here is called Secret Stories. Um, secret Stories is all about the idea that English doesn't just have 26 letters. <laughs> It has 54 different sounds that we have to know because SH is not SH. SH is SH. And there's a whole story that goes along with this out of this book. Uh, the author's name is Katie Garner. We were supposed to have her here in January and she had a medical emergency with her family and was not able to come. We're working on trying to figure out how we're gonna make all that work. But the S and the H are very studious and they just can't concentrate when they're in the library, when people are talking, and so they like to constantly remind everyone, shh, right? So the kids can cognitively remember that in the back of their head, they got a little story that goes with it. I was at um, Fremont, as a matter of fact, and they had their A, a Y and A E day, and they showed Fonzie because no one knew who the Fonz was. Um, and they dressed up like that, and they went around, and they were all A A all over the school. So these are up now in all of our classrooms, K through three, and in our resource rooms as well. And I'll tell you, many of our fourth and fifth grade teachers have put them in their rooms as well because it's just good for our kids to have something to hold on to. I'm happy to pass this around so you get an idea. Um, I wanted to show you. Can I ask a question, or should I wait till the end? This is what Hagerty looks like. Hagerty is all about with your eyes closed. So if I said k at, what's the word? Cat. I can do that without my eyes open. I don't have to know that's a C. I don't know. I have to know that what that letter is. I don't have to know the sound it makes. I can do it orally. And this is where some of the magic comes. All the words and the routine is here for you. This takes under 10 minutes a day, and it gives our kids a chance to practice that skill. I think Trustee Lewis has a quick question. So you mentioned phonics, uh, but also it, what, I'm, what I'm hearing is un, sort of the undergirding uh, uh, sort of approach is mnemonic, uh, mnemonic relation. That would be for your secret stories part. There's the mnemonic to go with it, mm -hmm. correct. This is for your phonemic awareness, your phonological awareness, which is oral manipulation of sounds. And this is going to be for your phonics, which is going to be, I need to know the alphabetic principle of a letter, what that letter says, what sound it makes, blend it all together. And here's the magic to that. Everything that our teachers who work so hard need is right here. And we have purchased this for everyone. Um, and I'll get to the rollout in a minute, then this complements phonics because we, again, are not an A through Z. There's so many other things we have to know for English, and that's where these help us to understand some of those, uh, well, not all of those uh, digraphs, diphthongs, and those more complicated parts of English. Would you like me to give them to you to have them? You guys want to take a look at any of this? And Principal Gowdy went over all of that with me. Oh, she did. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That makes me very yeah, happy. She's a student. Okay, um, I will. I will leave them here, and you will tell me what you want me to do. Okay. Then, that was remember the first box, but we're not done at the first box. We must move on then to the second box. These are what we're using. 
The second box is for us to understand that listening or language comprehension. Okay, and without that, we can't get to reading comprehension. So these are the things that we are going to be working through. They're shifting the balance. Um, the first book, K2, is mainly about word reading and what goes along with that. They were inundated and therefore created a three through five book. And this is really where you get into vocabulary and language and how to bring um, our literature to life and to make sure that we are capitalizing on what, it, what is needed for that second box. Um, the other book that we have been utilizing and I've been doing PD at sites on is our NCAS book, The Teaching Practices from America's Best Urban Schools. They're um, specifically the Gatekeeper Vocabulary, Chapter 6, I believe. Um, we're really understanding, because of reading Chapter 1 together, what we have to do. And it's not an either or, it's a both. And without both, we can't get to the outcome of reading comprehension. So that's how we're planning on working towards it. So we are unpacking to move forward. And what we are unpacking is making sure that we understand what it is we need to do, that we have the tools that we need to do it, and then we have the equipping and the empowering to feel like we have it. Again, this is at all 15 of our schools. These items have been purchased, including some other uh, manipulatives that are needed so that we can do this together and the PD is going out together. In addition, we've had six, or we will have had six voluntary paid teacher trainings um, promoting uh, UFLY so that people who have been early adopters to it and really gotten into it have had the opportunity to um, provide very important information and confidence to their peers who have been a little hesitant um, at one of them. Um, Ms. Ambra actually helped us with this one and she had over 70 people who came to an online training, which is a lot of people. And we're averaging 35 to 40 for everyone we present because um, there's an interest. There's a true excitement going on around having the tools and the knowledge to do this. Um, in going forward, we will continue to use those with what we're collecting. And in addition, we will be uh, moving towards those performance scale assessments so that we can make sure that we are going back to um, some of our work with Marzano and, and whatnot to understand what it takes to be able to do a standard and to know our standards deeper so we can really accomplish both sides of that equation to get to reading comprehension. And the power of knowledge tools and working together gets us to um, this beautiful one that I knew from Turner, who with a big old happy smile on his face will be graduating uh, and being able to do the things that he needs to do because we are putting systematic, explicit instruction into all of our classrooms. And I think that's what I have for you. But of course, I have anything else you want to talk about. <laughs> Thank you so much, Ms. Mayler. So what we'll do next is we'll take the two um, public comments and then we'll call you back up because I'm sure we have a few more questions, that's if that's okay. <laughs> All right, first we have Amber Dagan. Hi, so um, I know that you guys probably, hopefully you guys recognize me because I have been here quite often talking about how necessary it is to move towards structured literacy and to move, move towards evidence-based practices. So I just wanted to speak up in support of this. Um, thank you, thank you um, for listening. Thank you for doing this. Um, I had the pleasure of working with Deb and I had the pleasure of providing PD on UFLY. Um, UFLY is a fantastic systemic direct instruction pro phonics program. I, I, I am in love with the program. I have seen huge results in my students. So I just wanted to say thank you. Thank you for that. Secret Stories is fantastic. Hegarty is fantastic. Most of the teachers that I know that do Hegarty really love it a lot. Um, and I just wanted to say it works. It's really great. Um, 
So um, that being said, one of the things that I, a suggestion that I have and some things that I've been thinking about as I've kind of been on my own personal journey towards being a better teacher and better educator, um, because, you know, when I was being, when I was going through the credential program, I didn't get taught any of this. I had to learn this after I became a credential teacher, what structured literacy is and what direct instruction is and all of this stuff. And it took me being willing to put myself out there and go, I've been wrong and I've been wrong about this and I wanna be better because I wanna do right by my students. So um, some of the things that I have, um, you know, just kind of learned along the way, um, the types of assessments that we have really make a big difference. And one assessment that we are using currently at Fremont that I feel has been um, really big and a game changer in my personal classroom is called M-Class. Um, I talked about dyslexia. Dyslexia is, I think, something that we should put a lot more focus and emphasis on. I feel like it's something that, you know, we could get a lot of bang for our buck by focusing on helping students with dyslexia, um, because dyslexia is a spectrum, it's not an on and off switch. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a lot of things you can do to mitigate its effects in the classroom without needing to go into SPED services. Um, M-Class is a really great reading benchmark. It's nationally normed, evidence-based, and on top of that, it has a dyslexia screener in it. Um, so I would like to advocate for maybe considering that because we do need better, we need more assessments. I like the IWT and I like the BPST, those are great assessments, but M-Class gives me more data than the BPST does. It gives me a lot more, like a really great example, one of my students, you know, um, on the BPST, he did really, really well, but when I gave him a test on, um, on the M class, his decoding skills weren't as good because he did not do as well in the nonsense reading portion, which was really surprising to me. And once I saw that and I zeroed on on that, I'm like, okay, I know you need more decoding help. I didn't realize that. So anyway, that's my time, but I wanted to say something about that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next we have Amanda Freitas. Good evening. Uh, as many of you know, I've been coming for the last several years advocating for better literacy instruction in our schools. Uh, this summer when I heard that Deb was taking over or stepping into the role for ed services and literacy, I was beyond ecstatic. I've had the pleasure of working her, with her in my previous district and I knew how passionate she was about this and how great she is at presenting the information to staff, especially like in a PD. Uh, we had the pleasure when we came back from uh, December, our winter break, where she did the PD for uh, shifting the balance for us. And there were so many teachers, I had a couple teachers go, who was that that came? That was the best PD we've had. Mm -hmm. You know, I've been in the district for nine years. That's the best presenter we've had come speak to us. Um, when I spoke to you during the summer, I said that there's two books that I thought that every elementary school classroom should have, You Fly and Hegarty, and Deb made that happen. So I'm very excited in the direction we're going there. I've been fortunate to be at Fremont where we've been doing this work for a little bit longer um, due to the grant that we had. And I will say I've been teaching fourth grade at Fremont for, this is my 10th year, and this is the highest reading class that I've ever had there where at least 50% of my students are reading at grade level. And I know we're thinking 50%, like that's not that great, but considering most of my students were not decoding efficiently before this school year says a lot. Um, one thing I do wanna advocate though is while a lot of my students are reading at grade level, I have students who are still reading at a kindergarten level. And it is almost impossible for me as one person in my classroom to get those students to where they need to be. So I just wanna to continue to advocate for reading teachers and classroom aides that could help us facilitate small groups in our classroom to really target those students. Thank you. Thank you. Great, does anyone have any questions on the presentation? Oh. Uh, Trustee Hernandez? Uh, yes, we'll start with uh, Trustee Lathan and then we'll go to you, Trustee Lewis. What is our, I should know this, but what is our board adopted curriculum for reading? Mm -hmm. Wonders. Wonders. Okay, mm -hmm. so the, the material that you share with us is supplemental material? Supplemental. Okay. And for the word reading part, we will be utilizing 
we will be utilizing the majority of it will be coming out of this. We have worked with uh, many teachers who have stepped up. One of the things that we have is a decodable crosswalk, which is literally taking the U fly lesson, let's say it's that tricky SH, and that lesson, there's a decodable that comes with UFly. Then we've also crosswalked it over to the, all the stories that we have from Wonders that also are SH, so we can utilize those small, those small books and those decodables for that as well. So there's teachers who are doing these projects because they're so excited to share it and to make it useful and usable for their colleagues. Thank you, and my next question is implementation. Um, I know that that has been a struggle, and it's, it's a struggle for a lot of districts, but in particular, teachers have said here, like, the implementation is um, not very, not as strong as it could be. And so what is the implementation idea? And then do we have a physical plan? Because it's always the best thing is to actually have an implementation plan. I love your question. Um, for, you know, like a three-year, three- to five-year plan on how we are going to effectively um, and make sure every teacher is trained Right. Um, properly and teaching right. effectively. So I didn't mention that um, in addition to the chapter one, which we found to be really important for everyone to have, that we've done something called short day one, short day two, long day one, long day two. Um, and what we've done is we've really utilized the videos that are on YouTube from UFLY because they're excellent. They're training videos. And then um, two of the vice principals said they would work with me. We built... PDs for these short days. There's two 20-minute short days. We built the PD. We embedded the little video. We gave a script. Um, and then the admin came to a Teams meeting where I went over it with them so they could present that back at their sites. So they did that for 20 minutes. They did it again for 20 minutes. And now we're doing these long day videos, which are bigger overviews. When we come back in August, we will be doing the implementation of day one for the actual UFLY lessons and day two. And we have those days already built into our calendar for next year, as well as the ongoing that's going to continue with each site. So we definitely, and then we have plans so that when we have new teachers coming on board, just like we do for the BPST, um, I'm sorry, for CRLP, that we do the training for them for UFLY so that they know if they're coming into a kindergarten through second grade room, we're not just like, good luck. Do we have a written implementation plan? We have the beginning of the implementation plan. Um, we have it up to that point, and then from there, we are still continuing to finalize where we are, but we are, um, I think one of the benefits of me just leaving a principal chair is that you kind of know how busy the principals are and to have them, some of them, this isn't their jam. Like, it would be like me trying to go and be a calculus presenter. Not going to happen so well, but you want me to do it because I'm in charge of a high school, so you need to feed me enough so that I feel comfortable and give me what I need so that I can then go and do it. I'm not going to do it as well as the calculus teacher, who's now a principal, but I can do it if you get me to that point. And that's really what Ed Services has worked really hard to do this year so that we have equity to all of our teachers at, and, and therefore all of our students at all sites. So you'll be able to share the plan once you have it? A hundred percent. Okay, perfect. Thank Promise. you. Promise. And it is concerning when I hear that elementary school principals don't have the skills because that's like they should um, yeah and they I'm do glad now that you're there want to know why support Be because we've really 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 worked so that all of us have an understanding right now of foundational reading it's a foreign language like it's 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 no joke some of that stuff and and they are great they were upper grade teachers and whatnot but now we have a really solid foundation so I think part of thinking about future hiring for elementary principals is having those skills because if you've been a teacher like the teachers in the back were very clear about how to teach reading like that that's with the credential if you have a multiple subject credential you taught multiple subjects and you should be able to do that so I just think as we're thinking about future hiring for principals in elementary like they should have been strong practitioners in the classroom in order to be a principal in our district and I don't want to sound like that they weren't. It's just that there's so many you didn't things sound going like on. It. Okay. Yeah. And I'm always that. available also. Um, there are some principals who I adore because they're like, okay, I get this, but I could choose a little bit extra. And I visit them a lot more often. And we sit down and have talks. And then I go, who 
who are you? And what did you do with it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> because they're having these really deep, rich conversations. So it's really yep. been beautiful to watch. So you, I just want to clarify, you never said okay, that. Okay, good. <laughs> um, I just know from being an educator, okay. right? If folks are struggling to know how to do this, that means that they probably didn't do it in a classroom. And we should have people who were strong practitioners right. in a classroom. Um, so th that's one. I can't wait to see the implementation plan. Um, and then why voluntary? Because I heard you say mm. there are voluntary trainings, mm -hmm. and I'm not clear. Like, it's mm -hmm. not an option for black and brown kids to learn how to read. Right. And so why is it an option for teachers to Because this has been a soft that? rollout year. So we purchased okay. it early on. We had it um, purchased in, I want to say, October, and we got it to the sites. Some sites were like, give it to me now. We are ready to go. Some sites were like, if we do this right now, we're not going to be able to do it as well. So it is not voluntary for that short day, short day, long day, long day. But we are offering additional uh, voluntary trainings for people to be able to come to with the idea that those will continue to be embedded like you were talking about the plan um, with some of the most important things. We've even videoed all of them graciously. Our presenters have all said yes to being videoed. We can take those trainings for next year and, and hand them off with, you know, cut and paste what we need to and make it where then everyone is getting them at their sites for their PD time. I'm also going to add one small thing just because it's fresh on my mind. We were this morning at Grant Elementary School um, doing our weekly visits, our entire ed services um, team, and the principal there, Ms. Mullenbrock, was sharing how her second grade team had taken off and were implementing this fully. They wanted to be early adopters. And she said that that's actually helped the entire staff because they're seeing the progress that's already happened. They haven't, and these are experienced teachers, what she shared, and they haven't seen the incredible amount of growth that's happened in their careers. And so I think that's, it's kind of creating this groundswell of interest. And so she feels that it's actually going to go farther because she's got on-site folks that have, mm -hmm. have um, experienced it and have shared their success. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Last question for me. I look forward to, you know, I, I love this topic. You and I have talked about it, mm -hmm. and I'm so glad you're in this position. Thank Congratulations. You. Thank you very much. Um, I'm wondering, hoping we can start shifting at some point uh, to literacy. I know I heard one of the teachers talk about it, but really to start really embedding the writing too, because we know what brain research says about reading, writing, and speaking. Um, and sometimes for some kids, the actual writing of it helps them to learn to read stronger. So I'm hoping that we can shift from reading to literacy. And we're working on that right now. That's part of what we're learning. Um, if you, the deeper you know into reading, when you do something like the word cat and you say k at, and you kind of push each sound up, we're now teaching something called orthographic mapping. It's part of the training that I do for every single person, and it's K through six, where now we've pushed up each sound, and now we're going to pull the sound back down, and we're actually going to write the sound that goes with it. So, mm -hmm. so it's at, decoding and encoding. encoding. Yeah. It's, and that's, so, that is 100% part of UFLY, just so you know. Okay, good. Okay. I hope to see that in the implementation plan. Uh, okay. okay. Uh, Trustee Lewis? First, I just want to sort of President Rocha. Yeah. I just want to thank you for the presentation. Uh, you know, uh, some of the things you mentioned, multimodal learning, you know, uh, implementing sort of Howard Gardner's uh, theory of multiple uh, intelligence, multiple intelligences is, is vital. You know, we talk about learning sort of as a sort of as this sort of thing that happens to people, but there's an experience that happens. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was really happy uh, to see that. And then, you know, the combination of etymology and mnemonic uh, devices you're right, <laughs> right. <laughs> because I've heard about this, but I've never seen, you know, gotten this level of uh, detail. So I just, yeah, great job. Thank you very much. Thanks. Vice President Rocha. Okay, uh, I was just wondering, I know that I've been at the school and I've, I've been there and some of those fifth graders that are going on to, to junior high uh, have problems with the reading part. And I know that we have reading teachers at the elementary, but when we get to the junior high, it's the resource teachers. It's a little different. Yeah, we have some we have some uh, programs that we utilize to help with students who are behind at the middle school. And um, I know that uh, Read 180. I remember, I'm I gotta learn my middle school, high school uh, a little bit more. But Read 180 is one of the things we utilize. Um, I hear what you're saying. Uh, I want you to know that UFly can be used as an intervention. 
in third grade. It could also be used as a small group intervention in fourth grade and fifth grade, especially for our fourth and fifth graders who not just in the city of Antioch, not just in the state of California, not in the United States, but in the whole world, our fourth and fifth graders across the world are suffering because of the time that they missed some pretty foundational stuff during the pandemic. And we're pretty all, you know, aware of that. So um, the other good thing is in doing this book with all elementary teachers, they have gotten very excited and want to know more. I had one uh, today, I was at Diablo Vista and specifically asked if I could possibly do some three through five trainings that gave them some more word reading time, um, not as deep as the lower grades, but so that they could help their, their children who are struggling like you're talking about. So uh, do we have a plan for the second level? That right I will now we're only find out about. Elementary. We are, but it said elementary reading and assessment and instruction. <laughs> so yes, you're right, I will find out more. Uh, no, I'm just wondering because I know you, basically we want to do something at the elementary level because that's the most important part. Mm -hmm. But right. we have those that have skipped through, like you said, mm -hmm. and what are we going to do when they get to the other side? So that, I'm just asking Good question. for the future. We'll work on it. I mean, something basic, I think, or, or do we it need a reading we, teacher? It could be that we that's do the, some basic instruction there, too. That's the question I have. Do we need a reading teacher at the second level or just a resource teacher? Good question. I think it's something we'll continue to look at. I know at. it's a finance issue, but I'm thinking mm -hmm. to myself, do we need to rethink of what we're doing at the second level? All right, we'll go to Trustee Lathan and then Trustee. Sorry, I wanted to follow up with uh, what Trustee Rocha said, and I think that's beautiful, um, what you said, because if not, we're going to we'll have a whole generation of kids who are in middle and high school who continue to leave illiterate. 100%. And I'm inclined to say it was not the pandemic, because a teacher came up here and said this was the first year that half of her class is actually on grade level reading, and she's been here nine years. So that tells me that there are kids, here, and I've looked at the scores over the years, so sure. it's not... Pandemic. I just think it might be even more so, but I agree with Potentially. you 100%. So I, I love what you said because it does feel like a part of that, and it might not be just you, Miss um, Deb, mm -hmm. um, as the one person for, you know, 15,000 kids, <laughs> but really thinking about um, the secondary schools, too, um, because our kids can't continue to leave illiterate. Um, and it, that's, that's really unacceptable. Um, there are, my first year of teaching uh, was special education, and we did use programs like that for the upper grades um, in small groups, and so there could be ways where you're not, we're not embarrassing children, because they get embarrassed at that age when they can't, when they can barely decode words. And so safe spaces for kids to go to learn, um, uh, to decode in a way that will help them, and there's always these, you know, there are developmental ways to do it, where they actually have access to material that's on their level, but it helps them break down. Because they can comprehend when someone reads to them, most right. likely, the it's the actual decoding and the encoding that are a uh, factor. So I hope that we can think about that. Uh, maybe someone partner for the middle school, uh, the, you know, the secondary levels, which is usually 6 through 12, um, so that our, our uh, middle school and high school students also start getting really intensive support before they graduate. Yeah, so thank you for bringing that up, Trustee Rocha. Uh, Trustee Hack, any comments, questions? Uh, basic comments, thank you for being here, Share, sharing the program that you are obviously going through with everybody else and, and the staff. And as a board, we're, we're, we're blessed by those types of programs. So thank you for sharing with us. Thank you very much. Thank you for allowing it to happen. I think there's a lot of excitement right now I won't say I think there is a lot of excitement right now. It's pretty fun. And then I just have a few questions on the tiered systems of support. Mm -hmm. um, can you maybe walk me through what's the intended movement that students go through this? Like, is the intention for them uh, to move vertically from tier, uh, you know, as they need support, we try tier three, tier two, tier one. Is a student that's placed maybe immediately in tier one expected to move down the tiers, or do we hope that they okay. move off from so needing the support? So tier one is everyone. It's 100% of the students get tier one instruction. That is what tier one means. So everyone is getting it. And now if we're going to have a program that maps it out for us and we do it faithfully, um, and we have, as the teachers, we have the materials we need to do it. It should be most of the time that somewhere between 75 to 80%, 85% of your students are going to be successful with that. 
Then we move to a tier two, which is despite doing that, they still need more. And that might be small groups, whether in the classroom or having um, reading teachers who are also coming in and helping. Um, that's kind of where tier two is. It should be about 10%. And then we get to that tier three, right? Which is, okay, we still are having trouble and that's where we need more intensive supports. Did I answer that or am I completely off? Yeah, no, no, that's definitely, okay. yeah, for sure, um, the main piece of it. And then the other question I have to kind of follow up that is, um, do we have like an idea of what the timeline looks for some of these students? Like if a student's in tier three, what's our hope for um, them to come down to tier one um, in the long run? Do we expect them to need tier three in, for a very long time? Like what's... Uh, well, when we get we to tier three, we usually are looking at kids who are who are significantly um, struggling, uh, and it might be that that's when, um, as was brought up, like we need to make sure we've exhausted everything that we can before we move to a tier three um, special ed and all those other things. The dyslexia screening is starting. Um, it has been. The law says that. Um, we will by December thirty first of this year be provided a list of what the. Um, Screeners can be, I will say the BPST and Hagerty are both screeners for dyslexia. They may not be the ones that we choose to go with, but they are screeners for dyslexia. Um, and then we also have uh, by June 30th of 2025, we have to have made a decision on which, which screener we're going to use here in Antioch. And then by the 25-26 school year, that, that dyslexia screener has to be given to all K through two students. So we will be working on that. Um, and I will tell you, I don't mind sharing. As they'll tell, I, I talk about myself when I this. Um, I am dyslexic. Um, I was put in as MGM because back in the day, it was a verbal test and I talk. So I was labeled as gate and then by third grade I couldn't read. And I had a mom who made sure that that didn't happen and all of that and I tell the story. If not for a mom who made sure I got what I needed. So if not me, then who? If not now, then when? And if not here, then where? So dyslexia is near and dear to my heart. Uh, it, all of this is near and dear to my heart because I wasn't dumb, but I thought it was. Well, thank you so much for sharing that. And you know, we've seen your passion as you were presenting and it's nice to see a little bit about where that comes from. Um, and then the last question I have is, um, we heard so much about um, uh, the way that teachers enjoy this program, uh, what do we know about the student experience? Oh. You know, do they, do, what, what, do they <laughs> enjoy the program? Are they having fun? Uh, yes. And um, I was actually got a text from a principal who was in the middle of doing their formal evaluation at the end of it with a teacher who did UFLY for their formal evaluation. And the kids, she goes, okay, it's time for, and they're like, you fly. And then they, they click, um, and it checks off. And the kids, they made up this own little chant in the classroom. They're like, we got to check. We got to check, whatever it is that they do. And then um, she's like, okay, we're done. They're like, no, we want a three-syllable word that we figure out. These are first graders. Like, they cannot handle it. I was at Muir, and the principal says that... Um, there was a child who went somewhere else and he looked at that teacher and he goes, what time is it? Couldn't tell time yet, but what time is it, right? Well, it's, I gotta leave, it's you fly time, I gotta go. I gotta go, I gotta get to you fly. Like they are really excited about it. If you wanna go sometime, I will take you. Definitely. Call me, we'll go check it out. Yeah, I'll definitely be reaching out. Okay. All right, well, thank you so much, thank you um, much. for the presentation, we really appreciate thank it. Thank you everyone, I appreciate your time. Moving on to item eight, hearings, we have none. Uh, item nine, public presentations, we have none. Under 10, consent items. Uh, is there uh, any consent items that we would like to discuss or pull for a separate vote? Uh, yes, Trustee Lathan. Um, just one. Just item 10M, service agreement with Jones Hall. Um, I was looking through the um, contract and page five, um, number six, I think the number is wrong. And so <laughs> if you look at item uh, 6C, um, it says for the service attorney, service of attorneys as disclosure counsel, the fee is, and it has 20, I think it's supposed to be 20,000. Oh, I see. But that, but it could also be 200,000. So, <laughs> and that's a big difference. So just to, uh, just to correct that. And I'm sorry, oh, I just. Okay. Uh, I should have emailed you and told you. That's it. But what should the number be? Twenty thousand or two hundred thousand? Twenty thousand. Okay. Okay. 
So I think when we vote on it, just make sure we put that in there because that's important um, that we um, update that. Got it. And that's all I have for t for that area. T Any other items? Mm -mm. Great. Um, I'll go ahead and make the motion just to make that uh, clean. Um, so I move to approve all items on the consent calendar, items A through S, uh, with the acknowledgement that under item M, the legal services agreement with Jones Hall um, has a typo on page five and that the number under item 6C should read 20,000 per series um, and currently has an extra zero there. I'll second. All right. The motion has been properly moved and seconded. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say no. And the motion passes. Moving on to 11B, uh, we have the updated uh, salary schedule, um, and we also have the uh, revised item on there in front of us. And I'll turn it over to Dr. Martinez. Yes, as you mentioned, this is just the results of, again, the board's earlier action tonight uh, to have uh, confirmed salary schedules. These are uniform salary schedules for all of our classified, certificated, uh, and management employees. Uh, so we have to have board approved salary schedules in order to move forward in our system. The amended uh, document was simply we needed to make sure that the information within the MUNIS system does not have sense included. It's an interesting rounding process, so things were rounded up to just basically clarify and make sure that those are the right numbers that would go into the system. Is there any questions or discussion? Otherwise, I will entertain a motion to approve the updated uh, salary schedule for the 2023-24 school year. I move approval. Second. All right, so it's been moved and seconded to approve the updated uniform salary schedules for the 2023-24 school year. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say no. And the motion passes. All right, next we're on 12 items for information, discussion, and action by board. Uh, we have 12A, uh, grant writing, um, and I'm happy to introduce this. Uh, the point of this item is really um, to... Um, make sure that as a board we're okay with directing staff to bring a presentation on what our current kind of grants program is um, and the management of those grants. I know that we've had discussions up here about uh, getting a grant writer, so I think it'd be uh, great to get um, information on right now, what grants have we been applying to? Is there grants that we consistently apply to? What's, uh, what are the grants that we are getting? What are the grants that we're not getting? What does the management of those grants look like? So that um, then we can, uh, from that presentation, have a conversation about whether that still makes sense to look into the idea of a grant writer. Um, I'm just really looking to kind of wrap up that conversation because I know it's a conversation we've kind of been having threads of for a long time. Um, so this can be a quick item unless people have other discussions. We're really just looking to direct staff to be able to bring this presentation forward. Cool. Is everyone, all right, Superintendent Nello? Sorry. I'm wondering if it would be helpful first for me to provide information in the Friday board, and because some board members might think that's all the information I needed, or how I guess I need to know the format that the board would like. Either Friday board or a presentation. Yeah, that's, I think, I think either could work, but I, yeah, it'd be good to hear. Yeah, I can, uh, so, if I'm understanding uh, sort of the scope of this request, if we can get a listing of all current mm -hmm. uh, grants, mm -hmm. do you want, is the, the, is the request for pending or secured? Um, I think just like the entire landscape of okay. what our grants have and, and over the, yeah, the process, um, you know, because, uh, you know, we're, we, we need to figure out what exactly is the thing that's holding us back. Like, is it that... Uh, capacity in writing the grants? Is it capacity in managing the grants? Is it um, that we need identification of grants um, and really figuring out and make sure that we're addressing the right uh, item there? Um, so I think, yeah, so I think a, a Friday board makes sense as long as when we come back to that discussion that we all have understood what's in that Friday board agreement and that we're able also to answer, uh, to ask additional questions off that information. Yeah. So you're asking for an initial step. Yeah, a, a report that's going to be brought to us I, through Friday board letters, what it sounds like the preferred method versus a presentation. Yeah. Initially. Yeah, I'm okay with either. I think, um, actually, I, to be honest, I would prefer a presentation because uh, the Friday board packet is um, it's an interesting way to kind of communicate 
all the things that we have, but I will, if the consensus of the board is to look at it through the Friday packet first, I'm okay with that. And so in that presentation is, is the goal to then identify the uh, grants that folks are applying for, the potential grants that we could apply for, and when we say management, to use your, parline, uh, to use your language, um, the management, is it central? Or I know that some of the teachers applied for grants, but it was sort of a one-off deal where a teacher found a grant, they applied for it, and then they're done. Is that, is that kind of the scope we would like in a presentation, if that's the route we go? Similar, right? Like our, our goal is not to identify grants. and see no, 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 no. Right, our goal is to see what's been the process and what are the grants that have been identified, what's been the management process of those, uh, what have been the results of those applications to grants, um, um, and just kind of get like a sense of the landscape so that we can find where, if any, um, opportunities for support exist, either through, you know, as we've discussed previously, a grant writer, or, you know, if maybe the bottleneck is management, maybe there's something different that we need to be thinking about. So the first step would be to see what grants we're talking about and then react to that information. Yeah. In addition to, right, the, the management and all the other information, yeah. not just a list of grants. But to react to it mm -hmm. in some manner. Okay. I think yeah. I understand. Okay. I it. see enough nodding Great. heads. I think I get it. And if um, there's something that after you get the information, <coughs> there's a, a question from one of you, feel free to let me know, and then I'll respond to everything <coughs> so that you have the information. Great. Trustee. I have a question. Mm. Uh, let's go tra uh, Trustee Latham and then Vice President Rocha. Uh, Trustee Clyde yeah. Lewis. <laughs> yes. You have mentioned grants for the last year. Mm -hmm. What do you want to see? And know and learn in the presentation or eventually what do you so the goal in my mind would be for us to hire a centralized grant writer because and the reason for that uh, is if we have a so if we look at the concentration of our population right so we have a very high percentage of foster youth we have a very high percentage of uh, unhoused uh, uh, youth we have a very high percentage of you know you go down the list we have a very high percentage every year there's a certain allocation of money that can go to support those populations. Now we get concentration grants in our, L, um, in our uh, LCFF uh, funds and all those things, but if we're thinking about the totality of the student, those grants actually only serve a piece of that you know, student's need. And so by going after these additional grants, I think we can be more nimble in terms of the, uh, addressing uh, the needs of those students. So I think it's sort of a, it's sort of a step approach. I think what uh, Trustee Hernandez is suggesting First of all, understanding what grants that we're going after, I think that's a great first step. Then we can understand what grants are available to potentially supplement those grants. And I don't know which one would come first, that or uh, identifying that centralized management system because I can also appreciate if everybody's applying for different grants, the management of those grants, the reporting of those grants is probably a little bit unwieldy and it doesn't necessarily do us a lot of good as a district. But if we have a centralized way to say, okay, well, we went after this money, and a result of the, after going after this money, these are the impacts that we were able to make, and this is, I think that's sort of a more logical uh, sort of a, approach uh, in the long term. So that's, hopefully that made sense. Yeah, I'm asking because I think part of the reason why it's on here is because, yes, Trustee Hernand, uh, President Hernandez has the question, but also because you've been talking about it for a long time. Yeah. Um, and so, with that, the information that Superintendent Anello shared in terms of putting it in the Friday packet, will that suffice for what you're yeah. looking for? As the, as the initial step, yes. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for that. Okay. Vice President Okay, Roger. my question was that on our consent items, there's a number R, service agreement with collective agency. So is that sort of a, a grant writer? Sorry. Ooh try to do that beforehand. Um, yes, yeah, so we are, uh, we are contracting in this particular agreement with a new grant writing agency, and it's to go after, we've done, we've received this grant in the past, it's Prop 47, um, and so we already have some ideas on how, what we want to utilize, um, and that's the thing with grants, is it's intended to supplement or ex in expand what we're doing, not to supplant it. Mm -hmm. And so we already have that in mind, and we wanted to utilize this person. This agency comes with a great track record, and we thought we would try them out for this particular grant. Can I, can I respond? So does that take care of the issue that we had, well, or is that on top of what you want to do? 
I would suggest that it's on top of. So, for example, that's an identified grant that we know about and we, we've gone after, we're comfortable going after this. And I, you know, however, there's a number of different, like, so for example, under Prop 47, uh, there's, there's tiers of grants. And so, because we've received that one grant, we're probably going after that same grant. What about all the other grants that may support, uh, to your point, uh, the other parts of our students that we need? And so, if we have a centralized grant writer, we can understand the scope of our district, say, okay, well, this is the direction we want to move. Now we can go after all these grants because we have sort of that core, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, that, that core um, that would shape, shape the direction and, and, and uh, the types of grants that we would go after. Okay. Yeah. So the yeah the intention of this is right. So so something like that would be included in the report that this is one of the ways we go after grants because we are getting the information to see if something more centralized makes sense. But uh, we need to know what we're doing now, and if that's working um, based off what we see in this information that we're going to get, then maybe our approach is different. Um, but I think it's important that we're all working off that same information when we have that kind of discussion. On that point, can we also include the amount that we're paying for? folks to write grants, you know, in a given year? Because if it's, you know, $200,000 over the course of a year, that's a salary that we could just, you know, centralize a position for. Yeah. Great. It sounds like we have a good direction on this. Great. Uh, so we'll move on now next to item uh, 13, resolutions for first reading. We have none. Uh, 14, resolutions for immediate action. Item A. I'll turn over to Dr. Martinez. Yes, this is a resolution uh, requesting that a teacher be granted the authority to teach outside their credential area for a home and hospital student. So again, it's difficult oftentimes to find individuals willing to support our students. Uh, this individual is willing to do it, but we need the authorization in order to provide uh, services to the student. Um, and yes, the uh, credential <laughs> is closely, al closely aligned to the credential <laughs> holder's uh, area of expertise. Great. So unless anyone has questions, I'll entertain a Move motion. Move approval. I'll second. Great. So the motion has been moved and seconded. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say no. And the motion passes. Keep forgetting to turn that on. Um, since the next one's coming up are ones that the board has seen before, you can also take them in a vote on them instead of separately, if you would like. It's up to the pleasure of the board. Got it. Okay. So we... Um, Definitely have a number of public comments on item 14F. So um, let's, um, yeah, so let's do. Um, I can make a motion if it's okay uh, to, uh, I can move to accept uh, items B, C, D, E, and G. Um, yeah, so I'll move to accept the remaining items under 14 with the exclusion of F. Perfect. There's a motion on the floor to accept uh, items 14 uh, B through G with the exclusion of item F. Is there a second? A second. Great. Is there any discussion on, on that motion or any of the items there? Great. So uh, all in favor, uh, so the motion on the floor is uh, to approve items 14 B, C, D, E, and G. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say no. And the motion passes. Um, so now we'll look at item 14F. Uh, if we could just get this item uh, quickly introduced by staff, and then we'll go to public comments, and then we'll go to any questions or discussion that uh, my colleagues have. This it refers to the Citizens Oversight Committee and the resolution to add Measure B. Great. So the first uh, public comment is from uh, Charlotte Luther. I object to staff selecting the board members for the oversight committee. I do not trust the district due to various reasons. I personally have been through a significant number of challenges with the district as a student with an IET. I, Charlotte Luther, do not agree that staff should pick who is on the committee because it is biased. I request that community and the board select and agree about who is on the committee and that the board said rejected committee and then there's information as to why they were not chosen. I feel that an unbiased, as, uh, that an unbiased group, the community of parents, should make the selection. I am the We Get It Foundation ambassador 
We Get It Foundation is a nonprofit that has been, existing, has been in existence for four years. It was started in Antioch due to a need in the community that was not being fulfilled otherwise. I believe in We Get Foundation and the CEO of We Get Foundation, who is also a special education advocate, Elizabeth LaVos. I am one of the students she advocates for, and I stand by her completely. Thank you. Next we have Kate Luther. Uh, thank you for giving us an opportunity to speak. Uh, I do want to start, first of all, by saying that um, we got here on time, and my daughter and I waited over um, two hours to be able to speak, and um, we feel disrespected that we had to wait that long, and um, we were not asked to speak sooner. That being said, um, I echo the sentiments that my daughter just shared, and uh, my daughter is... Um, special needs student in this district. And uh, we feel that parents do not trust the district due to various reasons. And we have been through a significant number of challenges, myself included, with districts as parents, with students with IEPs. And we do not agree that staff should pick who is on the committee because it is biased. And we request that the community and the board select and agree about who is on the committee and the board send a rejected committee members information as to why they were not chosen. We feel that an unbiased group, the community of parents, should make the selection. I'm a board member of We Get It Foundation, which has been in existence and it was founded here in Antioch due to an unmet need. We serve the neurodivergent community here and internationally. We believe in We Get It Foundation and we believe in Elizabeth Lavas, who is a special education advocate, and I am one of her parents, and I am proud to say that. Thank you. Thank you. And I apologize. I should have noticed that we had a number of public comments on this and recognized that it could have been a good idea to move that forward. So I'm sorry, and I appreciate your patience in being here. Uh, next we have uh, Danielle Caro. Good evening. It took a while to get here, but thank you for the sentiment there. Um, my son is important. I'm a mother of a six-year-old boy named Cooper. Um, and really, all education is important. All students are important. All special education families are important. Um, and since COVID, this being my first child going through the school system after a pandemic has been extremely challenging. Um, and I am here with We Get It Foundation to object the staff selecting of the board members for the oversight committee. I am one of the parents who does not trust the district due to various reasons. Um, and we have also been through our significant number of challenges um, as a parent of a student with an IEP. It is not fair that selected member or staff gets to select the members of this committee. And the one current open role is not enough representation currently, especially depending on who, where, and how they are selected. I know that was discussed on increasing the number, but the one that's currently existing is not enough. Um, we request that the community and the board select and agree about who is on this committee and send the rejected committee members information as to why they were not selected for transparency. Uh, we feel that an unbiased group, the community of parents, should make this decision. Um, to briefly state my own experience, my child's privacy and safety was disregarded on day one of kindergarten this year um, because his information, his classroom name, student ID, everything was posted on a window on a Friday afternoon for me to figure out who his teacher was. Um, and his teacher was not a, a special education teacher. We found out on day one that he was a PE teacher who had no credentials for SPED. Um, and my child, I was supposed to trust to leave my kid in this classroom with someone who didn't engage with the parents and had no real understanding understanding of what they were getting into. Um, so on day two, I actually found out halfway through day one that he was in the wrong classroom. So the district had misplaced my kid into general ed TK and then into the wrong mod severe classroom. And then I got a phone call midway through day one that he was in the wrong class. The other teacher he was supposed to be in the classroom for had no idea where on campus he was. Um, so day two, I brought him to the right classroom and was told I, I had to leave him with no aid. 
no aides in the classroom to support the class. Um, and had I not taken pictures over the course of a couple of weeks, I wouldn't have had anything to prove that my kid was coming home in the same soiled diapers that I was sending him to in the morning. So five and a half hours of school with a direct one-on-one -on -one at some point not being changed. Um, and that's also to state too that classroom does not have appropriate changing stations for children that are not, that have toileting needs. Um, so their dignity and all of that is completely thrown out the door. Um, I've also had to physically restrain children that are not mine um, because my, my concerns for safety about having things like safety gates, baby gates in a classroom were disregarded until children actually eloped and district members saw that present in, in person. Um, so I'm a parent who was born and raised in Antioch. I went all 12 years through Antioch schools, graduated from Deer Valley, and I, I shouldn't have to fight for my kid like this. Thank you. Next we have Melanie Flight. Thank you for letting us speak. I would like to say that I also object to staff selecting the board members for the oversight committee. Many parents do not trust the district due to various reasons, and we have been through a significant number of challenges with the districts as parents with IEPs. We, the parents, do not agree that staff should pick who is on the committee because we feel it's biased. We request that community and board select and agree about who was on the committee and that the board send rejected committee members information as to why they were not chosen. We feel that an unbiased group, the community of parents, should make the selection in representing a citizen oversight committee. <laughs> we are We Get It Foundation parents. We Get It Foundation is a nonprofit organization that supports autistic and otherwise neurodiverse individuals and their family. And we have been in existence for four years. It was started here in Antioch due, for, to, a need in, due to a need in the community that was not being fulfilled otherwise in any parent, student, or other organization in existence. We believe and We Get It Foundation and the CEO of We Get It Foundation, who is also a special ev education advocate, Elizabeth Lavas. I am one of her parents. And I would also like to mention that people who are part of We Get It Foundation were waiting for this item to be read and had to leave. This meeting has drug on for hours, about two hours, mostly regarding reading intervention. I think maybe of four items. And while we understand that's important, we did have neurodiverse parents waiting to hear this item, waiting over two hours and they had to leave. And I do not find that inclusive. I would also like to mention that I find it ironic in during a time, awareness should be brought to neurodiversity and that it should be celebrated that the school board is voting to ensure school district staff is selected for what is called in its own res resolution, a citizens oversight committee. We are the citizens of Antioch and parents of Antioch. And we request that the oversight committee be provided back to our community and the board instead of to the school district. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you. Next we have Javier Puloth Leslie. I'm a little under the weather. Sorry about that. Um, you can keep your mask up if you're not feeling well. We love you. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you, darling. Um, I'm with MEC. Not just playing, bro. It's too <laughs> serious in here, bro. So we object to the staff selecting the board members of the oversight committee. Many parents do not trust the district due to various reasons. And we have been through a significant number of challenges with the district as parents of students with IEPs. We the parents do not agree that staff should pick who is the committee because it is biased. We request the community and the board select and agree about who is on the committee and that is the board send reject the committee members information as to why they were not chosen. We feel that an unbiased group, the community of parents should make the selection. We are we are we get a foundation parents. 
We Get It Foundation is a nonprofit that has been in existence for four years. It was started in Antioch due to a need in the community that was not being fulfilled otherwise. We believe in the we believe in We Get It Foundation and the CEO of We Get It Foundation, who is also special education advocate Elizabeth Lavasse. I am one of her parents. Um, just like every other pioneer, we all had our issues. Sad that we went through a certain issue and we had to reach outside of the school district for someone to assist us. There was everything was left in the blind for everybody. Um, my kid was actually over there the first day at Lung Tree, and I'm the one who actually got the teacher fired to let go because I walked up to him, asked him when he got hired. He literally said the week before the school started, when I asked him what's the plan, what's the issues, have you ever dealt with kids like this? He said he's never done it. He has no plans. He don't know what's going on. So I reached out to the principal. I reached out to Amanda Wong, I believe. We did a meeting in the library. Questions, no answers. When we asked what's going on, I was told by the principal that she had no say on who got hired. Um, so there's a trust issue, right? So in order for us to go through what you guys want on your books, you gotta have some trust. And obviously there's people here that don't got no trust from you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have Kevin McNaniman. Hello, my name is Kevin McNaniman. I've been a resident of Antioch for 30 plus years. I uh, also have a child in the special education uh, program. Um, I also object uh, to, for the board members, uh, uh, for the staff to be selecting the board members for the oversight committee. Many parents do not trust the district due to various reasons and we have been through a significant number of challenges with the district as parents of students with IEPs. We the parents do not agree that the staff should pick who is on the committee because it is biased. We request request that the community and the board select and agree about who is on the committee and that boards uh, send rejected committee members information as to why they have not been chosen. We feel that an unbiased group, the community of parents, should make the selection. We are We Get It Foundation parents. I'm also a board member. We Get It Foundation is a nonprofit that has been in existence for four years. It has started in ANIAC due to the need uh, of the community that was not being fulfilled otherwise. We believe in the We Get It Foundation, the CEO of We Get It Foundation, who is also a special education advocate, Elizabeth Lavasi. I'm one of her parents. That's it. Thank you. Great, and that's all the uh, public speakers we have on this item. Uh, do any of my colleagues here have questions or follow-up? Yes, uh, Trustee Lathan. Yes, yeah, so, um, Ms. Robbins, myself, and Trustee Hack are going to talk about, um, are going to meet before the next board meeting um, to talk about uh, the committee the, in the process that we all talked about earlier uh, to make sure we have a clear process. We do outreach. Um, and, and I'm hoping, so I don't know if we have to approve, this is a question, um, the item F, which um, is adopting the bylaws for the governing uh, of the Measure B Citizens Oversight, or if we can include this in our meeting and bring it back to the next one. Is it, do we have to do it tonight, like by law? I do not believe we have to do this um, okay. by law, but I don't know that anything that we're discussing is gonna change the outcome of this particular thing, because we're basically adding most of its legal stuff, and I think what, what's been discussed here or the concerns is more of the process okay. of the selection but this just outlines the seven categories of what we legally have to do, and mm -hmm. we're just basically adding the new bond B, measure B that passed, mm -hmm. but it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily go into the process or how we select. So could it, though, include the process? Could we add that, or is that this not the document for that? This is not the document okay. for that. Well, it, it, it does include, right, part 5.5 .5 is the appointment, which includes some of these, like, selection and how we're going to advertise it kind of pieces. Okay. So I guess I'm wondering, um, you know, if the board's okay with it. I think 
uh, based off comments we heard, I think in good faith, uh, maybe a, a motion would be to uh, make sure that we bring this to our next meeting. That way we have a solid timeline. Uh, we know that you and Trusty Hack are going to look at this. Um, and it may be that, that, that this ends up being pretty similar to what it looks like. But I think um, just to make sure that we're respecting like the comments, which I think are fair, um, that gives us the time for you two to present uh, what we uh, will be looking like for the application process and communication. Would that need a, a motion or would that just be general consensus? I think let's do a formal motion. Just I, I think um, that that's a, a good faith move for us to do and show that we uh, are listening. Yeah. So I'll move to uh, delay the vote on item uh, 14F or tape to table. Uh, it'd, it'd actually be a motion to postpone and then you'd spe uh, s specify the date. Okay. Which our next meeting is May 10th. May 10th. Yeah. Okay. So I, uh, I move to postpone uh, item 14F mm -hmm. to our May 8th. Uh, 10th. May 10th board meeting. Correct. Great. Second. So there's a motion on the table. It's been properly it's seconded. Eight. It's the eighth. Is it the eighth? It is the eighth. Oh, did I? Oops. Yeah, I you're right. Sorry. Yeah, <laughs> to the eighth. Sorry, sorry for that correction. Um, yeah. So that it's been properly moved and seconded to move item four uh, to postpone item fourteen F to the May eighth uh, uh, Antioch Unified Board of Education meeting. Uh, is there any discussion? Is it seconded? Yeah, it's been seconded. Yeah, by Vice President Rocha. Uh, so if there's no discussion, uh, all in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say no, and the motion passes. Okay. Moving on to um, 15 resolutions for second reading and action. We have none. Uh, 16 board policies for first reading. And this uh, board policy is new, and it goes along with the transportation plan that Nate presented at the last board meeting, and it establishes the miles, uh, the walking distance to or from a bus stop for the particular grades. Does anyone have any questions on this now? Sure. Mm -mm, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, well, it's just for first reading, so we'll go ahead and keep moving on. Uh, 17 board policies for second reading and action. We have none. Mm -hmm. 18 information items for general information. Uh, we have our quarterly report on Williams Uniform Complaints, and I'll turn it over to uh, Ms. Ibarra. Yeah, so this is covering the quarter, the third quarter, which was January through March of 2024. There was one um, complaint with regards to fil uh, facilities, and it has been resolved. And that's what was reported to the county. Is there any questions? Mm, good. Or comments? Um, do you know what the, do we have any more details on what that facility's uh, condition I was? I knew you were going to ask. Yeah. And normally I have that information and I don't have it with me this evening, but I can provide it um, in Friday board if that's helpful. Is there a way in this document that you can include This it? is the county's document and so we just follow the document that they provide, but I can certainly get that from staff so I have it to inform you. Yeah, no, what I'm saying is in the future for these, just include the complaint or at least a summary of the complaint. So if we make it a part of the process, correct, then it'll then you don't have to you know remember because it's right. there. It'll be there. Okay. Yeah. Great. If there's no more questions, we'll move on to uh, 19 future agenda items from board members. We'll start with uh, Trustee Lewis. Uh, none. The grant. Yeah. Great. Vice President Rocha. No, I'm fine. Great. Uh, Trustee Lathan. Future agenda items. Um, yes. I'm hoping for regular updates on board committee meetings. I'm just not sure what that looks like. If we add it to the agenda, an, another agenda item or if during the superintendent's comments, it's just something you, you do each time. Um, but also the chairs, so myself, Trustee President, Hernan uh, President Hernandez, um, Trustee Rocha, and Trustee um, <laughs> Lewis may also want to talk about those. I'm really excited about the equity committee. But also, um, you, uh, we know there are some challenges, severe challenges around special education in our district, and we have a uh, special ed committee, uh, board committee. So what's happening? So I think th that's important. I know that was very long. <laughs> um, and um, also, at some point, it doesn't have to be the next meeting, I want to talk about like a policy on students being alone with staff 
and um, like individual students and what that looks like. Maybe I should connect with you um, around that, but I don't see any policies around that and I could be so, I could have overlooked it. Yeah, okay, we'll go to Trustee Hack and then we'll so circle back to Trustee Lewis. I'll pass. Great. So I do want to get an update on the uh, J JFROTC. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I know that there was delays before because there was a, sort of a, a glut of programs. Yeah, freeze, there you go. Um, so if we can get an update, that'd be great. Great, and then moving on to uh, 20 additional comments which exceeded the first 30 minute session limit. Uh, there are none. Uh, 21 reports and comments from board members. We'll start on the other side with Trustee Heck. Uh, just a lot of music programs. If you wanna get outside and listen to some good music, it's, a, it's all over the place. There, we're having a STEM community event um, in Living Color, a hands-on STEM community event. Please look online, www.steminlivingcolor.com for more information. It's Saturday, April 27th, and we have some amazing vendors that are um, participating. We have face painting, you know, DJ, like the whole nine. So super excited about seeing our community out. Um, and really uh, grateful to the uh, uh, Superintendent Anello and the district for making it quite easy to share um, the process in terms of sharing flyers with schools. And so um, that's it. Thank you. Great. Vice President Rocha. You know, I don't have her name, but I have to say that I attended the Supervisor Cesar Chavez event, mm -hmm. and one of our students was given an award. And I know last year we recognized an individual uh, the same thing, and so I'm sorry that I didn't bring her name. I wasn't thinking ahead, so I'll bring it to the next meeting because I think that's important. <coughs> Trustee Lewis? Uh, absolutely. So uh, a few things. I also attended, I know there were several Cesar Chavez uh, events. Oh, yes. Uh, so I attended one of them where we engage with students and, uh, well, I guess young people. Younger than me. I have, I'm a gray, I have gray hair now, so I can say young people. Um, so we engaged folks uh, and talked about career and life exploration, kind of like how we got to where we are. I think all the trustees were there. Um, yeah. I found out later because I saw it on Facebook. I didn't see people there, but uh, there were quite a few people there. So it was great to see everybody. And then also, we held a community meeting uh, it was about two weeks ago uh, where we wanted to bring folks together and talk about not, this wasn't directed at anybody. This was, the goal wasn't to bash anybody, and we made that very clear. The goal was to come together and have conversation around collective challenges that are impacting all of us. You know, I think what ends up happening is all of us have our, you know, uh, ways of explaining things. We have our sort of hiccups. We have our whatever. But what we don't have a lot of is an opportunity to come together and say, listen, this is why I think the way I think. This has been my experience. And then sort of walk back. Uh, and walk through uh, some of those experiences. That way we can understand, we all live together. We all have to work together. We all have to breathe together and enjoy this community together. So it was a really uh, good turnout. Uh, I think there's been calls for more. We haven't decided if that's gonna happen. Uh, you know, apparently there's been some comments about it, but you know, I mean, if people are unhappy with bringing the community together, I deal with it. Um, but that's, those are a few of the things that, that we've done. Can I say one yeah, more thing, Rocha. I'm sorry. I'm glad you came. I need two names. Okay. One is our uh, uh, chamber uh, person, Frida. Yes. Can you just come up and tell me the name because I'm feeling sorry that I didn't. And we also had Antioch High School, the one that went to uh, the Caesar Chavez. I don't know if you have that na name, but I'll get it for the next meeting. I, I do have the first name. Fafita Grew was our Youth of the Year and it was also honored by the Women's Club. And the Caesar Chavez winner Oh, you do have it? Uh, maybe. Oh, maybe, okay, maybe because would. I'm sorry. I was going to have to bring it next time around. I wasn't prepared. I have one more, Trustee Hernandez. <laughs> Good. And so while Lindsay's bringing that up, yeah. I do want to celebrate uh, the golf program uh, that is going on now. Uh, and I think it's under Lindsay's team, or at Lindsay's umbrella. Um, there's, a, there's a youth golf tournament, or training. I don't, it's top yes. golf, I think it is, first tee. We, we're doing first tee at Lone Tree. We have camp going right now. It's going really well. All of our sports camps have filled to the brim. 
Katie Ingalls, our assistant director of athletics and community engagement, is doing a wonderful job. The feedback we're getting from parents is they're thrilled. We're going to continue to expand next year with not only the camps, but also athletics for fourth and fifth grade. And they're going great. I've attended a couple. Thank you very much. Okay, I do have something that I wanted to put on the agenda. <laughs> the, the information on the sports programs. <laughs> You'll have to come back and give us that. We would love to come back and share that oh, with you. That's my request. I'm still looking for that name, but I'm going to find it by next time. Next time. Okay. Thanks, Thank Mary. Great. And I'll just share um, a little bit on some of the things that I've been up to since our last uh, meeting. Uh, so I attended the Water Education for Latino Leaders um, 12th Annual Conference. It was in San Jose. We went to the uh, Silicon Valley Advanced Purification Center where they take uh, wastewater and treat it in all sorts of ways with UV light, with microfiltration, and reverse osmosis to take this, like, really gross water and make it drinkable and they had it like um, they showed us what it looks like in different stages of the process so you see it start off like um, uh, well by the time they showed to us it's like yellow and then like it gradually gets ye less yellow and then we got to drink some of it and it's like been uh, processed so many times over that like in the middle of the process it's technically drinkable but our water quality standards are so high that it goes through the process so many more times so it's it's been drinkable long before it gets to, to people so often and that water is not water that people drink uh, it's part of um, what people are doing to try to uh, have us be more water resilient is be able to use these other sources of water. So this water is usually mixed with other water that's of not great quality so that people can use it for agriculture or other things um, and not necessarily for people to drink because um, people still feel kind of weird about that at times. Um, I did uh, two webinars for an organization uh, helping train um, school board members across the country to kind of um, learn how to navigate their roles a little bit better um, and that was really great to be able to connect uh, with some of my colleagues from across the United States. Um, both um, Dr. Jag was at, uh, and myself were at the, uh, an Urban League meet and greet, so working with the Urban League of the uh, Greater Bay Area uh, to figure out how we can maybe start to create some better supports for our, our students, because they're really eager, they do a lot, um, and they'd love to be doing more in Antioch. Um, I also was at that Civ Civic Leaders Luncheon, I, I think, you know, we were all there. Um, and then I also met, um, and Trustee uh, Vice President Rocha was also there, uh, we met with a lot of uh, elected Latino leaders in Contra Costa to try to figure out um, how we can um, uh, better serve uh, our Latino students and our Latino uh, citizens. Um, so I think that was also really uh, great. Um, and then both uh, Vice President Rocha and I were at the LMC uh, Cesar Chavez Awards um, and uh, where they recognize people in the community and educators in the community that have um, made a significant impact in the spirit of Cesar Chavez. Um, and um, I have to say, right, uh, Mary Rocha herself was a Cesar Chavez recipient of uh, that award in 2002. Um, so um, it's great to, to, to see all the ways that people have continued to contribute to the uh, community over time. Uh, and lastly, I wanted to share uh, the book uh, for um, this meeting. It's called Maybe. And it's uh, written by uh, Kobe Yamada, which, uh, who also wrote uh, another book uh, that I brought um, earlier uh, called What Do You Do With an Idea? Um, so uh, I really enjoy this one too. And it's really a book about thinking about uh, the potential that we all have, that students have, that um, really everything has around us and how do we access um, that potential. Um, I'm a really big fan of Kobe Yamada and their art style. So uh, I'll probably uh, keep tracking down more of the work that they do. Um, and it looks like uh, Vice President Rocha got the name, so I'll, I'll turn it back over to <laughs> Well, you. I actually want to say something about, I had attended an uh, ESL meeting, or no, an uh, ELAC meeting with, doc, with uh, Mrs. Quinones at the Antioch High School, and Morelia, who is the person I'm talking about, Gila Cabillo, actually was a translator because we didn't have one that day, and her mother cannot understand English, and she wanted it, she got, <laughs> it was interesting because she had um, our principal, uh, John um, on the spot uh, with her questions and her requests of needs for that school. And Morelia did a very excellent job in translating it and very clear on what she was doing. So she's the one that received the award at the chamber, another chamber, excuse me, the supervisor's meeting. So I just, we'll bring her name back again. Thank you very much for allowing me to do that. 
Um, and uh, lastly, uh, speaking of Cesar Chavez and that movement, uh, today is also uh, Dolores Huerta's birthday, and um, so they, she also made such a big impact on the farm worker movement and all of those activist movements, so I just want to also recognize that. Uh, moving on to uh, item 22, future meetings. So our future uh, meetings are on May 8th and then May 22nd. Uh, and then 23, adjournment. Um, so I will entertain a so motion. So Trustee Hernandez, in Sorry. honor of uh, Dolores Huerta, I can, oh, can't pronounce thank it. Thank you. Can we you. close the meeting in, uh, in her honor? It's her birthday, yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'll give you, I mean, you have the honor. It was your idea. Yeah. Do you want to make the motion, by, uh, President Rocha, and I'll second it? Oh, I move the closure of our meeting for Dolores Huerta and Cesar Chavez because it is his month. Uh, Perfect. We're almost missing it. But, and maybe next year we'll do more on that subject. Mm -hmm. uh, we've done it in the past at the school system, and I think we need to make sure that they understand that the food that's on the table is done by many, many people that are working very hard to get it there. Great, and I'll second that motion. Um, so all in favor of adjourning the meeting in honor of Dolores Huerta and Cesar Chavez, uh, say aye. 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 All opposed say no. No. And, <laughs> 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 and the motion passes. Trustee Hack wants to stay.